Oh, okay. We'll uh, call the meeting to order of the uh, Committee of the Whole Operations and Admin, and I would ask everybody, as you are able, to please rise. As we come together today, we recognize the great responsibilities laid upon us. Our council will always strive to understand the needs of the people we serve and to use power wisely and well. Our purpose is to establish and maintain a city of prosperity and righteousness where freedom prevails and where justice rules. Let us also not forget those who served our community and who are no longer with us so that we may continue to do the work we must in their memory. Please be seated. Uh, Deputy Clerk, has the roll been taken? The chair roll call has been taken. Thank you. I'll just briefly go over the uh, the rules of procedures for, uh, we are still in virtual, hybrid, in-person and uh, virtual meetings. So the uh, I'd like to remind members of council and staff and our viewing public of the electronic participation policy for hybrid meetings. For those staff and delegates joining electronically, please keep your video and microphones off until requested by the monitor or members of council. All rules for delegations under the city's procedural bylaw continue to apply. And the full corporate policy 50 regarding electronic virtual participation in meetings is available online for review. Having said that, uh, tonight's kind of a special evening in the sense that uh, we've got one of our senior folks who was actually attending his last meeting this evening. Um, I think uh, most up, up here know that we're talking about uh, Mr. Brian Hughes. Um, Brian started his career in 1981 with the town of Flamborough as an arena operator and worked there from 81 to 89 in this capacity. From 82 to 85, he attended and graduated from McMaster University with a degree in physical education. He was promoted to facility lead hand in Flamborough at the Carlisle Arena until 1993. <clears throat> he then became lead hand for Park operations and held this role until Flamborough amalgamated with the city of Hamilton. In 2001, he became Parks Supervisor Operations at the city of Hamilton and held this position until moving to the city of Brantford in 2004 as manager of Parks Services. In 2013, he was promoted to Director Parks Services, where he was successful in delivering capital projects, maintaining operations such as golf, cemetery, horticulture, forestry, and many parks and sports fields in the city of Brantford. Brian will spend his time with family and friends, and of course, his boat. You naughty boy. Brian, I'm sure uh, I speak on, on behalf of many, but I'm sure those here would like to uh, say a few words to you. But I, on a personal note, I can say that it's been a pleasure working with you uh, since 2004. Um, you've uh, guided us through some uh, turbulent waters at times, getting through uh, things that needed to get done and, and things that, to try and accommodate our users. And I think that was always first and foremost in your mind was to make things as uh, as easy and as accessible as you could for the uh, the users in the city, particularly the sports uh, community. And uh, they're appreciative of that. And I'm sure if they were here this evening, they would attest to that fact. So Brian, uh, congratulations. Uh, don't go adrift. Uh, don't run into any sand sandbanks. And uh, I think you'll do just fine. And I think you'll fit into retirement very well. So having said that, if there are any members of council who would like to say something, I believe Councillor Utley, uh, you're up, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, uh, Brian, I, I have um, enjoyed our years uh, since uh, over the past 11 years as a councillor working with you and your staff. Um, I, um, I, I look back on the last 11 years and how our parks have improved, our sports facilities have improved, um, and I've got another old oh, Canada Day was another big one before COVID. I know you put an enormous amount of work into that with uh, with your teams, and it was a first class uh, first class affair. And uh, so I thank you for that. Um, uh, did I read right? You you've been working for forty years. I, I didn't think you were that old, Brian. But um, anyhow, I I'm sure you got another forty years ahead of him. You know, boating, uh, I hope, and enjoying life. 
And um, I wish you all the very best of health and success in your, your next phase of your career. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Councillor Ali. Councillor Antosky. Thank you. Brian, I knew you before I was on council. My goodness, staff is really far away now. It used to be right behind me. <laughs> um, I used to come across, uh, we used to bump into each other at the Ball Diamond, at the parks with the vets, with you know a lot of the things I did in the community. And uh, so we had a different relationship then and we've had a good relationship since I've been on council. And uh, you know, I hear all the mentions of the boat. I think there's a, a couple of spiffy cars in there too that you get to enjoy. So um, congratulations. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Um, you get, you know, you got to head up the part of the city that's fun. And um, we really appreciate everything you've done and, and I hope you enjoy your retirement. Thank you, Councillor Antosky. Councillor Wall. Is this thing on? Okay, thank you, Sheriff Celeste. Uh, Brian, uh, I found myself in a number of conversations recently about those who work for the municipality and why they would want to work for the municipality. And one thing that I say loud and clear about all of our city staff is if you're going to work for the city, you got to have a, a need or a desire or a want to serve your community and make it a better place. And I think you are the personification of wanting to serve the community. Uh, you are never too busy to answer an email or to take a phone call. And you never ever say that anything is impossible. It's there's a way and we'll figure it out and we'll do it together and I'll report back when it's done. And I can't say thank you enough times for always being there for me with my questions, for my constituents, the people that I represent. You're just an amazing human being and this city has been blessed to have you and uh, whatever you do, wherever you go, however you do it, I know you're gonna do it incredibly because you are incredible. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wall. Councillor McCurry. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Well, Mr. Hughes and I, started at the city of Brantford around the same time, he in 04, I in 03. I was gonna comment about uh, his uh, his age and his length of service, but I, I'll, I'll, I've rethought that since I've done the math on myself. Um, Mr. Hughes has been around just about forever. And, and of course, as a long-term employee, he does get to enjoy uh, much off time with his boat and his wife and his dog. Uh, and uh, he travels on occasion to the East Coast and uh, we've run into him in our travels before. It's, it's interesting, uh, so now he'll have a little more time uh, to spend uh, pursuing his leisure, although he gets about 23 weeks a year in holidays, I think, due to his long service. Um, and somebody remarked about Mr. Hughes' love of automobiles. Uh, and I, I believe if you look at Mr. Hughes' fleet and you look at the fleet from the city of Brantford, I would have to think only transit and works would have more vehicles than Mr. Hughes has in his garage. And I believe I can honestly say that not one of Brian's cars is electric powered. Um, they're all big V8s. And, and uh, of course, those of us of a certain vintage are considerably jealous of that fleet. But um, I, I just want to say that I've had occasion to work with Mr. Hughes for a long, long time. I've always found him responsive. He's always looked after the needs of my constituents and he's looked after the needs of the people in this community extremely well during his tenure. Um, he's been a vital part of our organization for all these years, uh, up and down uh, the chart. He's well thought of, well respected, and he's delivered a lot of great service over these years to the citizens of this, excuse me, this city and the, the members of this council. I wish you well in retirement, my friend. Um, you've certainly earned it, and uh, we will see you around. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. Mayor Davis. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Celeste. So, Brian, I don't know you nearly as long as the, the rest of them, but uh, certainly we've had a lot to, uh, I've, I've dealt with in the last three years to a, a very large degree with Brian. And I have to say, Brian, I've always really appreciated the quality of your advice. It's always straightforward like, and easy to understand the way you describe the, the advice that you give us. And so you were a real help to me in, in dealing with some of the, the rec and park issues that, that we've had. Plus, you know, you're just a really fine person to talk to and a real joy to talk to. And I know that 
your future involves a lot more than I'm sure boats and cars. <clears throat> and I'm sure there's another chapter in your, in your life story that uh, we'll be very proud and pleased to hear about. And last, I want to say on a serious note, in the last two to three years, <clears throat> there has been a lot of change that's taken place here at the city. I'm talking about corporate reorganization and much of it involving what was the Parks and Rec Department. And that change put a lot of burden. It was a tremendous burden on you, Brian, helping to lead uh, the staff that uh, came underneath your responsibility and helping them through this period of transition. And in some ways, you can look at that as, I think, a crowning point of your career here with the city, helping in transitioning to the kind of corporate organization that uh, you really had no choice but to move forward with given current circumstances. And I thank you for your help and assistance through that process. And I wish you the best. Thank you, Mr. Trump. Thank you, Mayor Davis. Uh, next up is uh, Councilor Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Brian, it's been a pleasure. You've always uh, answered this, as everybody said, your, your emails right away and, and always had good suggestions. And uh, it's obvious that you enjoyed your work because your pension maxed out five years ago and you've lasted this long. So obviously uh, you enjoyed sticking around and uh, it, it's shown in the quality of the work that you did. And I just want to wish you all the best in your retirement. May you have a long and healthy and happy retirement. Thank you, Councilor Martin. Uh, Councillor Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Brian, I guess I've uh, known you since the beginning of your career as well. Uh, and I know you've leaned on a lot of really brilliant people in your department to make things work. And I won't mention her name, uh, but uh, you know, you, th your successor has big shoes to fill and we'll be keeping our eye on them to make sure that they are filled in the way that we're used to having a service from you. In fact, uh, the constituents of the city well, respect you because of the service you provide them. When I know when Councillor Toski and I call you, we have a concern in the ward, you're right out there with us, uh, with staff to address that specific concern. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about retirement, Brian, because that's not what happens when you leave one place, uh, however, however you leave, but you are certainly a valuable asset and other communities will be snapping you up in a hurry. So, but I would take some time to yourself first before you decide to go back to work, if that's what you decide. Uh, but you will be sorely missed here by myself and I know by my constituents. And uh, I'm really sorry to see you go. I, I wish you would stay, um, uh, but I know that's not possible. So really thank you for your service. Uh, you really have been an asset to the city. You've come up through the, through the ranks. You, you know everything about Parks and Rec and every, and every department that's connected with it. And you've provided this community and the citizens of Brantford with a tremendous valuable asset and that being yourself. Thanks, Brian, and good luck with whatever you do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Uh, Councillor Ben Tilburg. Well, happy retirement, Brian. Um, it's it's rather amazing that, that your work, your work is what other people enjoy as citizens and residents and children and retirees. That's going to our parks and going to the recreational facilities and basically enjoying all the things in the city. And so that was your job to make other people enjoy their lives. And I think that's that's pretty something because now you're actually going to take some time and enjoy your life. And, you know, we focus a lot on all those big things that you had to deal with. And sometimes the things that knit a community together are the small things. And some of those small things are our small parks. And so I just want to thank you before you go, um, because one of the things we worked together for a short period of time, and uh, depends on how you put it, but uh, Moose Park, Moose Park, small little park and a tight little community around it and with old aging equipment. And, you know, you wonder what was going to be the future of that. And you, you put it all in there and you drive by there and you see all those smiling faces and that's, that's people having fun and that's seniors sitting there and the bench is retired and uh, lots of small kids. And that's, that's kind of like uh, the big thanks, I guess, that you would get out of your work every day, which is probably why you stayed, but now you're gone and to enjoy it all. I just want to thank you. And on behalf of the community, I'm sure if they had the chance to, to know who to have said thank you to, um, it's being said right now. Thank you, Councilor Van Tilburg. Brian, I think you got the drift. Um, 
you're going to be missed and, and you were certainly appreciated for everything that you did. So thanks, Brian. Unfortunately, we have to move on uh, to, uh, to business now, I guess. So are there any uh, members of the committee that have any uh, declaration of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, uh, I'll call for uh, items to be separated. Item 6.11 and 6.12 will be automatically separated as there are presentations uh, regarding those two items. Are there further items to be separated? Councilor Otley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 615, Procurement for Structural Engineering. 618, Ada Palmerston Design Study. And 622, uh, Gold Recognition for Wastewater Optimization. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Utley. Uh, Councillor Martin. Thank you. I'd like to se separate item 6.1.14. Okay, Councillor Antosky. Sorry. Sorry, Melanie. Thanks. Um, item 6.2.3, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I didn't catch that. 6.2.3, the Climate Change Action, action Plan, please. <clears throat> Councillor Vanderstel. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, 6.1.13, thank you. Councilor McCurry? 6.1.7, Mr. Chair. Councilor Van Tilborg. I believe I just heard it. 6.1.7 was mentioned just before me, so that's the one I wanted. Okay, any further? Councilor Martin, uh, could you move the motion to uh, approve all uh, items separated for? Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. Uh, Six, Councillor Carpenter. 6.1.6, .6, please. Thank you. 6.1.6. Is that it? I think everybody's in. Okay. Councillor Martin, I believe you have the uh, motion to uh, approve all items not separate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move, seconded by Councillor McCurry, that all items, uh, consent and consideration, 6.1 and 6.2, not separated for discussion purposes, be approved. I'll call the vote. Uh, Deputy Clerk. Through the chair, the following topics are subject to the vote. Item 6.1.3. Brand West Phase 2 Subdivision Agreement and Road Dedicating Bylaw 6.1.4, Emergency Procurement to Design, Development, and Implement Lane Reductions to Able Road Bridge. Item 6.1.9, Public Works Policy Amendments. Item 6.1.10, Three Grand River Crossings Environmental Assessment Completion. Item 6.1.11, Service Review Opportunities Update. Item 6.1.12, Competitive uh, Procurement of Broker Services. Item 6.1.5, Vision uh, Zero Road Safety Committee Report 2021-1129, and item 6.2.1, uh, Committee of the Whole Minutes. All items not separated for discussion purposes carries unanimously on a recorded vote. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Van Tilborg, Wall, Antosky, Marn, Sless, Vanderstelp, and Mayor Davis. Thank you, Deputy Clerk. Uh, this evening we have two presentations. Uh, our first presentation uh, is with uh, Selby Congera, Director of Environmental Services. If I could call on Selby to please uh, come forward. And uh, Hempson Consultants, Andrew Mirabella and Christopher Ballette to commence their presentation. Present and that questions will be held until the item is on the floor for debate. Okay, thank you. When you're ready, uh, please proceed. Good evening, Mr. Chair and members of council. 
Um, I have with me, like you heard, Andrew Mirabella from Hampson to give their presentation on the water wastewater rate study. Great, thanks, uh, Shelby, and uh, good evening uh, to the mayor and members of council. Appreciate you being here today, and a pleasure. It's the first council meeting in the new building, which looks great. Um, the purpose of today's meeting is to go over the water and wastewater rate study. Um, I have 10 minutes, so I'm gonna get right to it here. If we can go to the next slide here. Um, I'll look at the agenda and kind of what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, overall, generally speaking, the city has been uh, fiscally prudent in the management of the water and wastewater services. Uh, regular utility rate reviews have been undertaken to ensure that revenues and costs um, are sustained. The water and wastewater rate study and corresponding financial plan was last completed in 2015. The city requires an update to the water financial plan to renew your drinking water license. Um, and then to ensure that license uh, is maintained, uh, the city initiated this uh, particular study in which the water and wastewater rate analysis will underpin the preparation of those financial plans under the Safe Drinking Water Act. The model that we prepared is over a 10 year period and covers the, the range from 2022 to 2032. If we go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the rate setting approach. And when we talk, when we do water and wastewater rate studies, we think about the full cost recovery approach. And rates are generally calculated when we think about full cost recovery in terms of the full recovery of your operating costs. And we based the analysis on the city's 2021 budget and adjusted those costs on a go forward basis to account for the effects of inflation. Different cost centers got different inflationary effects. Um, so we tried to be as detailed as possible through that analysis. Um, we've looked at annual debt repayments, both principal and interest payments combined associated with your existing debt, as well as any new debt that's going to be required in order to carry out the capital program. And we've also made provisions for certain enhanced services, recognizing the city is going to be growing over the next 10 years, and additional costs of loans may be required in water and wastewater services to facilitate that growth in the operating budget. We've done a full recovery of your annual capital needs. So your 10-year capital plan, as identified from 2022 to 2031, has been incorporated in here. The rate study really focuses on the non-growth related program. So the utility rates are funding the mostly the repair and replacement programs. Development charges fund first round capital for growth related infrastructure. And that continues to be maintained in this particular analysis. And then the third component here is the provision for future asset replacement, recognizing that your rates um, are gonna be looking at setting money aside in the future to fund repair and replacement of programs and capital assets that may be occurring later down the line. Our analysis in general, um, is predicated on forecasting new connections and water consumption, build water consumption over that period. If we go to the next slide, I just want to review quickly the capital program for both water and wastewater, which we've captured in this analysis. And we're showing the capital because it is fundamental in terms of the overall rate analysis itself. <clears throat> the capital program for water totals $217 million out to 2032. Of that 217 million, about 60% of that is related to asset repair and replacement activities. And those asset repair, repair, uh, repair and replacement activities are gonna be funded through the utility rates. Uh, the balance of the program is related to growth related infrastructure, which is gonna be funded through development charges. Um, what we have here and what we're showing is the componentized component of the capital program. So our green bars relate to non-growth related projects and the gold bars on top relate to your growth related projects. And then below that, we have the different funding sources associated with each of the capital programs within the years. And we see that we have rate reserves and utility rates, but also we have debt financing measures which may be required in order to facilitate that program. And that's important because those debt financing measures, both principal and interest for any new debt is gonna be incorporated into the rate analysis going forward. We have about $15 million for any new rate funded capital that's gonna be incorporated into the analysis going ahead. The last point I want to make here is that we see is the capital program itself is actually a bit front loaded. Um, we have a lot of expenditures in the next five years, and we have to manage that through the utility rates and through the reserve funds, which we've done so in this in this analysis. If we go to the next slide, we will look at the wastewater capital program. <clears throat> it totals about one hundred and eighty nine million dollars out to twenty thirty two. Um, this program particularly has about 70% of it is related to asset repair and replacement activities, the balance being growth related. Uh, we do have some debt financing measures, which is required, particularly in the short term, to carry out that capital. About $25 million is noted. 
Um, and this program itself is also front loaded, but also has a, a number of series of projects that are occurring outside the planning, or at least towards the latter end of the planning period, which is a bit different from what you saw on the water side, where most of the capital was actually in the immediate five year period. Recognizing that the 10 year forecast, the first five years is likely the most known and more realized. Um, those types of projects will change and occur as your capital budgeting process occurs over the next coming years. So if we go to the next slide, we will kind of dive right into what that means in terms of rates. Um, we have the calculated water rates here, both on the fixed and the variable. On the fixed side, um, we have the rates over the five-year period, and then we're showing you what it looks like in 2032. Um, so the first point here is the rates um, for 2022 are already adopted by council and there's been no change to those. So the real analysis starts post 2022. Um, we're showing no change to the monthly fixed charges over the planning period. So a 0% uh, change on the fixed charges and they are maintained at $9.22 per month. And that's shown for a 5 8 inch meter size. Your consumption charge changes is anticipated to change at 2.75% increase per annum only to the variable rate starting in, uh, again uh, for the post 2022 period. And what that means and what that translates to on the water side is an average impact of about 2.3% um, per annum over the next five years for water services for a typical household consuming uh, 200 cubic meters a year. So no change to the fixed component over the period um, as a, uh, part of the council mandate and then an increase on the variable rates uh, going forward from there at 2.75%. And that's for water services. On the next slide, we get into the wastewater services um, and what the calculated rates are there. <clears throat> and the wastewater rates, um, again, 2022, as adopted by council. Uh, Post-2022, we have 2.75% increase applied per annum to the variable rates. And we see that rate climbing to about $2.72 per cubic meter by 2032. We put a lot of emphasis on the first five years of the program. Um, that's when your rate study is going to likely be most valid. You're certainly going to be reviewing your rates again to the next rate study to facilitate the next safe drinking water renewal license application. And that study will be done again, and that will kind of inform the next five years. So we do a 10-year planning period, but the focus certainly for council's consideration is the three to five-year period. On the next slide, we show the rate impact per typical household, uh, both water and wastewater services combined. Uh, the rates that we have here, um, cumulatively speaking, water and wastewater is about 2.45% per annum increase on a typical household consuming 200 cubic meters a year, which brings us to about $979 in 2022, which is the rates that are going to be adopted by council and are being enforced or will be enforced and moving to about $1,100 um, for water and wastewater services combined um, in 2027 at the end of that five-year period. Again, 2.45% average increase. Um, and this is just for water and wastewater services uh, alone. If we go to the next slide, um, I kind of want to show uh, council what that means in terms of some of the reserve funds and some of those ending balances. And what we have here is tracking the reserve funds for both water and wastewater independently over that over that 10 year planning period. And what we see here is that the reserve funds actually over the immediate five to six year period actually declined from the current position in a way as required in order to facilitate carrying out those capital works that we've identified. And if we look back a few slides earlier, we saw that big front loaded capital program. We saw a lot of non growth related expenditures in the first three to five years. So we're drawing money from the reserve funds in order to pay for those works, but then we start to replenish those reserves uh, towards the latter end of the planning period. There's a couple of things that I want to keep in mind here and be cognizant of. As I mentioned, the first three or five years of your capital is most known. Um, we have a 10 year program for planning purposes, and I would imagine expect that that capital program starting kind of outside in the latter end of the period would be continue to be refined and more costs might be known as we plan for it. And second of all, we have to consider those values and that the reserve fund accumulation there in context of your asset replacement value, which is upwards of about $1.4 billion now. And as the city continues to acquire infrastructure and you continue to facilitate development, that'll put increased pressure on the actual capital itself. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, I will cap off here with uh, looking at the comparison in the benchmark and analysis. At present time, the city of Brantford rates for a typical household are on the lower end of the spectrum. 
relative to a series of competing communities surrounding you. Obviously, you've got about 20 seconds to wrap up. Yep. And okay. some similar size jurisdictions around you, uh, with Brad County being kind of on the higher end toward on that on that side of it, but generally pretty uh, very competitive with other communities. So if we go to the next slide. It's really just a conclusion slide, and that covers my presentation, um, which really just looks at effectively identifying the key outcomes here is that there's an extensive amount of capital that needs to be funded. Um, the reserve funds and your debt financing requirements really need to be closely monitored over the planning period and certainly puts the emphasis on that additional increases to utility rates are going to be required and needed to support both the operational and the capital needs of the system, um, while also ensuring that these remains competitive with some surrounding communities. Um, that is as fast as I can do that presentation. Uh, I will, uh, I guess, hold for questions afterwards. Yes, appreciate that. Thank you, folks. Uh, next up, we have uh, Rick Cox. Uh, if you could come forward, please, Rick. Um, Director of Corporate Security and Guard Services to commence your presentation. Uh, and please note as well, you have uh, 10 minutes uh, to make your presentation and questions will be entertained once this uh, matter is on the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. If I have with me here today, Steve, oh, I can take my mask off now. I'm at the table here. Thank you. Uh, I have with me here today, Steve Ramath, our technical secu security technical specialist. And together, we're going to make a presentation for you. Steve's going to start off and pass it off to me in a bit. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Good evening. We are presenting here recommendations derived from key findings and results of the Corporate Security Guard pilot project. This includes an overview of the essential corporate security enhancements delivered by the project and recommendation for a six month extension of the core services, which are anticipated as an ongoing security requirement. We will also provide an overview of the, our proposed next steps, including establishing our vision and mission for corporate security and recommended direction for staff to report back on options for a permanent security program beyond the pilot. Next slide, please. Corporate security vision. Uh, vision and mission is required to serve as a foundation and direction for integrating physical security risk management strategies into the overall risk management process across the corporation. So our proposed vision is to provide a dedicated team of experienced and skilled security professionals who provide a safe and welcoming environment by preserving the peace, preventing crime, and protecting life and property. According to best practices across other municipalities, significant and growing demands on the team and anecdotal feedback received during the project, the mobile security team is a fundamental service that directly supports this vision by providing the capacity for a professional security guard to deter and respond to incidents 24 seven across municipal properties. When looking at how the security incidents have been reported, the value of the security enhancements is clear since the mobile added capacity of the security team to proactively patrol municipal properties accounts for approximately 80% of the overall number of reported incidents. Next slide, please. Here we see how the corporate security guard service is an essential layer of both corporate security and community safety and to the deployment of both proactive and reactive security measures that form an integrated or layered security approach, which enables us to effectively leverage both people and technology. Each piece has a distinct role to play, specific jurisdictional limitations, service capacities, and advance the safety and security priorities of the corporation in different ways. Staff are currently investigating the option for implementing special constables as an additional layer of corporate security and community safety that would support city bylaw enforcement and security guard services. This would provide with more enforcement authority, for example, on enforcing all criminal matters, the Highway Traffic Act, uh, Mental Health Act, the Safe Streets Act, and Liquor License Act. And also depending on the granted authorities, they may have jurisdiction on both public and private properties within, a, within the defined geographic area of their jurisdiction. Uh, 
Next slide, please. So the Corporate Security Guard Service this year has provided us with the ability to adapt and scale up as required to address a variety of corporate security risks. The service has progressed towards becoming an essential resource in standardizing and optimizing the city's procedures related to alarms, emergencies, use of security technologies, and mitigating physical security risks. The demand for the enhanced services provided through the project has continuously grown since January. For example, the team has added 13 additional municipal properties and continues to receive requests for additional security deployments and will continue to be required to provide effective incident deterrence and intervention to keep people and property safe and secure. Next slide, please. So we've, we've noted that there, they've been approximately 700 reported security incidents each month, or that, that works out to approximately one every hour. The, uh, the security guard service has also saved the city a minimum of approximately um, roughly 6,000 to 12,000 in paid staff wages for callouts. And we've been able to rely on a prompt response time, typically ranging between two and 10 minutes. And the team has also potentially saved several lives through the 30 incidents where naloxone kits were administered. Uh, they've been deter deterring and intervening in a variety of criminal and prohibited activities that pose a risk to people and property. And through ongoing collaboration, additional efficiencies continue, can continue to be facilitated through supporting the city's facility maintenance, housing services, bylaw enforcement, health, wellness, and safety, operational, parks, transit, and environmental services and other stakeholders. Next slide, please. Smart security vehicle and 24 seven mobile capacity for security to deter and promptly respond to security incidents at any city owned property has proven to be a highly valued resource to staff and the public. The, in addition, the structured chain of command that's been introduced with security supervisors is a necessity to maintaining service expectations for this very high profile role. Security services, one thing we've noted that uh, security services on a housing sites account for an average of 24% of the overall incidents and resources and 37% of security patrolling time, which represents a significant demand on the team in the overall pilot. Extending and enhancing the security services is required to keep up with the growing demand and without compromising the capacity to maintain service expectations across all municipal properties. So staff are considering special constables that would be hired by the city. This would implement the benefits of a hybrid tiered security program with more enforcement authority while enabling city council to have the control over the service and ensure that it is tailored and accountable to the corporate security priorities and requirements of the city. I'll now pass this over to my director, Rick Cox, who will provide an overview of the financial implications. Next slide, please. Thank, thank you, Steve, uh, through the chair. The contract with our current provider, Active Security, runs out at the end of January. And as no further extensions are available without council approval, we are seeking council authority to extend the project until July 31st, 2022. Extending the contract until then allows for enough time after the budget process has completed for the competitive procurement to take place. That process will focus on securing the services portfolio authorized through the estimates process. The cost to extend the current deployment established and validated by the pilot for the six months is $288,660. Next slide, please. As part of the budget estimates process, staff will be providing a report outlining the various options that we recommend or would like council to choose between and the associated annual costs. We do have some preliminary cost estimates for you tonight, although they are subject to change. Continuing with the mobile security program that has achieved such success in the absence of a special constable program, or if Brantford Police Services provides special constable service, carries an estimated annual cost of $576,000. A special constable service controlled and operated by the city has an estimated annual cost of $930,000. 
other costs are still being evaluated, things like dispatch, fleet, equipment, and software. Combined, a city a citywide mobile, sorry, a mobile citywide security guard patrol with a city operated special constable team focused on the downtown area is estimated at between one. $0.35 million and $1.5 million annually, depending on the complement and the structure of the team. Next slide, please. I'm turning back to Steve. Thank you. <clears throat> so we are committed to continuous security improvements as a core management principle. And the software license currently own, is currently owned by the city's contractor. This limits the city's ability to control, refine, coordinate, and retrieve important data and to ensure prompt delivery of incident reports to staff who would benefit from having timely access to this information. Feedback received on the project from staff has included requests for these reports to be received sooner and more frequently. And again, this would enable staff to ensure that appropriate steps are taken to mitigate risks in a timely manner. Purchasing software licenses will ensure that this important tool will continue to be available to staff and the corporate security guard team, even when security guard contractors change. In addition to being more cost effective than a contracted vehicle, owning or leasing the fleet would enable the city to ensure that the team continues to have access to a well-maintained, safe, and appropriately equipped vehicle, which has been a challenge with a contracted vehicle. Access to a city-owned corporate security vehicle is also required to prevent the need for facilities management and security staff to continue using personal vehicles for city business by providing access to a city-issued vehicle for conducting inspections, overseeing security guard and other contractor deployments, and servicing alarms, CCTV, access control, and other security systems across our city properties. Next slide, please. So our next steps here are to adopt uh, corporate security vision and mandate. Uh, Folks, you're, you're almost a minute over. Okay. If we can get over. I'll wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. So these are our next, uh, our proposed next steps and timeline moving forward. And the included recommendations here to extend the corporate security guard services, as well as direction for staff to prepare a report that provides options for a permanent tiered security program are in direct support of council priorities of addressing short-term needs associated with community safety, improving capacity of bylaw enforcement, leading by example in property standards and maintenance and ensuring that municipal assets contribute to civic pride and safe, vibrant and attractive and inclusive neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Thank you, uh, appreciate your attention this evening. That concludes our presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. Before we move on, uh, apparently inadvertently, uh, Councillor Vanderstelt, uh, missed declaring a conflict of interest on 6.1.3. If you could uh, state your conflict and we'll re-vote re on that one item. Councilor Vanderstel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I was left with an open mic after uh, Council uh, were describing um, their, uh, their their feelings for uh, Brian Hughes, outgoing Director Brian Hughes. And um, my conflict is with uh, 6.1.3, which is uh, Lasani Homes. We uh, supply Lasani Homes with uh, product on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Clerk, could you please take the vote on that uh, that one item, please? Item 6.1.3, noting Councillor Vanderstelt's conflict of interest, cares unanimously on recorded vote. Members of the committee vote in favor as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Van Toborg, Wall, and Toski, Marn, Sless, and Mayor Davis. Thank you. Uh, we'll now consider the items that were separated for, uh, for discussion purposes. And I believe Councillor Wall, you have the uh, motion to put those on the floor. You would be right. 
Okay, uh, moved by myself, seconded by my ward mate, Councillor Ryan Van Tilburg, uh, that all items for consideration consent 6.1 and 6.2 separated for discussion purposes be approved. Thank you, Councillor Wall. And the first item is the uh, water and wastewater rate study, which we had a, a presentation on this evening. Uh, is there anybody would, would like to speak to that? Councillor Wall? Thank you. Through you. Um, okay, so 2020 and 2021, many more people were working from home and not going into work. And I know that not everybody was leaving Brantford, so it might not affect like how much water was being used, like washing hands, flushing toilets, doing dishes, doing laundry, et cetera. But I, I, I can only imagine that it did. Is there any data regarding like how much additional wastewater or water was used? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so um, in 2020, um, we had a um, 6% increase in overall uh, water uh, use uh, and uh, residential is around 11% increase. Is, how is, typical is that compared to other municipalities? Um, we are hearing many other municipalities are seeing the same trend. Awesome, that's what I wanted to know, thank you. Mr. Carpenter. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, just to celebrate, uh, when we're looking at uh, the wastewater and water study, uh, when, when we decide on fees, uh, and we do, we do work for uh, wastewater and, and, and new water lines, uh, how much of that, how do we determine what's road the city's road budget and what's the water department's budget for the rate pair? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the um, engineering department maintains the cost um, of the road program. So they know what is the, for example, if we are doing a road, there is water main, sewer main replacement and road at the same time. Um, we have a long history of unit prices. So based on that, it's divided between water, wastewater, storm and road. Okay, thank you very much. Council McCreary. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, do all municipalities charge for wastewater? Uh, yes. If they have wastewater services, then they would be charging for it. Uh, thank you. Uh, do, do any of the municipalities charge a flat fee for wastewater? Uh, through the chair, that depends. Some, in very limited instances, would have a completely fixed charge. Um, or in even more limited instances, in a couple of cases, they've done it through the tax levy. Um, but that in most cases, it is still a combination of fixed charges and a variable rate. Can you explain what you mean by through the tax levy? Um, there's been a few municipalities that have charged the, have just funded wastewater services through the tax and not on a dedicated utility rate. So from the general revenues received in property taxes. Yeah, which is contrary to what the legislation actually uh, wants to do and what has been done. Most municipalities, virtually all municipalities in Ontario have gone to a utility-based structure, um, but there are still a few that, that do, mostly smaller communities, no, no larger cities or anyone of your size. So what sort of penalty do those communities pay for crossing the province? Uh, there's no teeth to legislation, so there isn't uh, anything that would that would be a penalty. It's just user rate supported services should be funded and directed towards user funded services. So Could you make us a list of all the provincial legislation that has no teeth and no penalty? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I appreciate what's before us today showing the comparators. Um, do all municipalities charge a fixed fee as part of their water rate? Through the chair, most do, yeah. And it's becoming increasingly more common to charge a fixed fee simply because the cons the consumption patterns in most municipalities has actually been declining even with new residential and non-residential development. Um, that's pretty consistent what we've seen in across Canada or Europe and North America. So you introduce the fixed charge to balance off those declining consumption trends and maintain a stable revenue source. 
So, so the would, cities- it, would it be fair to say then that our our success in teaching people to conserve water is counterproductive to their own pocketbooks? Uh, you have a pretty good structure right now in terms of your balance between fixed and variable. Uh, your especially on water, it's about twenty percent fixed and and eighty percent variable, which is on the lower end of most municipalities. They have a higher fixed charge, so your conservation element to your rate structure is there. And would you happen to know what our cost is, fixed and variable, to produce a cubic meter of drinkable water? Most of the cost that you have, that the city has, is actually fixed in nature. Um, the cost of the plant being available and producing the water would, in most municipalities, produce a fixed charge of kind of upwards of 70% of the cost being fixed. But in order to promote that conservation element, there is a balance to produce and kind of direct more of the cost recovery to the consumption-based rates, is which the city has done and what most municipalities do. There's no provincial mandate to the stipulates what cost must be paid from the fixed fee, is there? Uh, that's correct. There's no provincial yeah. mandate. Thank you very much. Are there any further speakers to this item? Seeing none, Deputy Kirk, please take the vote. Item 6.1.1, 2022 Water and Wastewater Rate Study, CARES unanimously on recorded votes. Members of the committee vote in favor as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Van Toborg, Wall, Ventoski, Marn, Sless, Vanderstelt, and Mayor Davis. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to 6.1.2, Corporate Security Guard Services Plan. Uh, financial impact two hundred eighty-eight thousand six hundred and sixty dollars plus HST. Are there any uh, members wishing to speak to this? We have lots. Uh, Councillor Wall, you're up. Thank you. Through you, so I've got a number of questions. I'm going to riddle them off, and then I'll let staff try to answer. And what I'm kind of hoping for maybe is some input before this goes to council at the end of the month. So my first question is regarding property taxes in the to uh, the core, in, in the downtown. Do we know in total how many how much property tax is collected just from the core? Next question. Uh, what about, I'm gonna preface this by saying like when an event is coming to community, they have to do like an economic development impact. They have to talk about like what kind of impact this could have and how it could impact the businesses and the stores and how it could bring money into the community. What I'm imagining is that a safer and more desirable core has economic impacts, whether it's inspiring new businesses and endeavors to come to the core, which is potential property tax increases, or it's increasing people coming to the core. Like when Frosty Fest happens, you know, 10 to 15,000 people come downtown and go to local restaurants and shop who are all tax paying businesses. So have we had somebody who has the authority or the expertise in saying that, you know, if we were to have a security program in the core for a decade and it was established and it was just the best security program you've ever seen, has that economic impact been predicted? Um, next is, do we have any idea of the costs that we have avoided from vandalism, from damage, from... It, it's hard to elaborate on, but I think you'll you kind of get what I'm saying. Um, and then has all that been like the cost of securing the downtown versus the savings occurred from having security in the downtown and then even still the potential revenue. And then finally, um, doesn't the city of Brantford have vehicles? Don't we have lots of vehicles? Uh, lots not being the operative word, but we gotta buy another one? I mean, what are the bylaw vehicles doing when bylaw like, or what about trucks? We, we have vehicles. We have to buy a specific security vehicle. That one I hope you can answer tonight because I can't imagine we don't have just a truck or a car line around somewhere that we could use and slap security on the side of it. I mean, I, I figure. Okay, and then the last thing is, is the people of the core, the residents, the business owners, the organizations, the associations that live in the core all pay taxes. They pay municipal taxes, they pro pay provincial taxes, they pay federal taxes. And there's only one taxpayer. <laughs> the people and they don't really care uh how that money is like 
what's part municipal, what's part provincial, what's part federal. What they care about is that their money's being used to make the community that they live in, they love and they work and they operate their business of or that they're in is a safe and vibrant community, which is one of our uh, mandates uh, as the corporation of the city of Brantford. And I know that the optics of this is that this program costs a lot of money. I've had so much criticism, whether it's in my inbox or it's through phone calls or it's through social media or just casual conversations with the people I represent out in the community. But I, I'm just looking for, especially before we come back to council at the end of the month, some sort of something that says, yes, this costs a lot of money, but can you imagine how much money we're saving? And the last thing is, is the fact that this security group can show undeniable facts that they've saved human lives because this program exists. You can't put a value on saving a human life. I wouldn't want to, you couldn't quantify it, but I know that this security program is leading to a better downtown, which is ultimately leading to a better Brantford. But if we have to quantify it, I'd love to be able to, because there is a lot of property taxes and a lot of money generated in the core, and some of it should be used to securing the core, right? Okay, I think I'm done, thank you. Councilor Wall, were you looking to get an uh, answer to that at council? I don't know how to work this thing, Councilor Sless. <laughs> okay. You're on. Thank you. Ideally, I'm looking for data based on all of the stuff that I just rambled, which you may have to uh, review at a later date. I am wondering about the car thing, though. Do we have to buy a security? Like, is do we really have to buy another car or do we have one lying around? Uh, that's an honest question. I'm hoping it can be answered tonight. Okay. Yeah, I think staff have an answer for you. Uh, through the chair, uh, Shane Pepper, fleet manager, jumping in before Rick jumps in, uh, unless Rick has an answer that I don't have. Um, to answer your question, Councillor Wall, um, we do not have a surplus of extra vehicles that are not assigned or dedicated for use. We do, however, have a bit of a reserve pool that we do surplus around from department to department seasonally or based on projects and demands. For example, um, an increase at parks in the summer for seasonals and students, and then over to operational service for road troll road patrol program. Um, so it, it, it's something, sorry, you're getting a long answer here. It, it, it's something we could look at and explore. It also depends on what equipment or additional outfitting may be required for the security vehicle. Perhaps Rick and his team could answer that in more detail. Yep. Through the chair, I can add to that. Um, in regards to the security vehicle, there are several very specific requirements uh, required by the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services in regards to uh, markings on the vehicle, uh, barrier that would need to be installed to facilitate safe detention of any sub subjects um, that are placed in the vehicle emergency light bar and spotlights and several other features specific that would be specifically required to equip the security vehicle. Uh, so uh, presently there aren't any vehicles available to the team that meet those requirements uh, from the city's end. So it, it is currently being provided through a contract. And uh, as mentioned, there are uh, potential cost savings with the city leasing or owning the vehicle and also ensuring that that vehicle meets the requirements by the ministry is uh, one key piece that we would like to make sure we have control over. Okay, thank you. And your time's up. Councillor Martin, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through you to staff, uh, if I understand this report correctly, the city can hire special constables directly. They don't have to be hired through the police department. Through you, uh, Chair Sless, yes, Councillor Martin, that's, that's correct. There would be some licensing that's required through the police, but we are able to control that and uh, uh, that, that special constable is under the city portfolio. And that would be handled under the same department that runs the security? That's right. So part of the cost in the report 
um, does speak to the need for a management structure if this was to come in as well. Um, but yes, that would be through that group. Okay, thank you. Councillor Utley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, couple of questions, um, but first, uh, thank you for the report. Uh, it was very sobering reading uh, with, with some of the uh, statistics, but a good report all the same. Um, my question is similar to, to Councillor Martin, and that is, um, who, who governs special constables? Are they, is it the same as, as police, regular police officers? Through the chair, there, the special constables are governed by the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services, uh, similar to private security guards. However, there's an additional uh, layer of accountability that's built in with the Pol police services board and through their appointment through the police structure as well. So would, would they be um, reporting to, to you or to police services? If they were hired by the city, they would be reporting to city staff. Okay, and, and any link with, uh, I would assume, I would hope uh, that uh, there's some uh, communications um, between our special constables and uh, Brantford Police. Yes, so the police are usually involved in training that's provided to special constables. In addition to that, they are involved in essentially recertifying the service on a periodic basis. And I, there, there are some um, quality assurance built into that recertification of the, the special constable service. Thank you. And one last. Uh, um, do you feel we're, we're winning the battle here with downtown especially? Uh, we've been able to see that the security guard team has been making an impact in terms of providing a visible presence, providing that capacity to respond to incidents, and also having some level of deterrence with the incidents. Um, we've noticed that the team has been effective in deterring incidents on municipal properties, and um, that's shown through our, um, through our stats. And, and the progress of the team on their on on their incidents that they've been able to report. Thank you. I I, I know that some of the letters um, or messages from in the report uh, speak um, uh, very they're very supportive of the service that you're providing. So that's um, that's good to good to get that feedback. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Utley. Uh, Councillor Antonsky. Thank you, Chair Sless. Um, I don't have questions. I, I've got a couple of comments that I'd like to make. Um, the first, you know, I'm, I'm sad that, that we're here and this is what we need, but we're certainly no different than a lot of our communities across Canada. Um, and, and I recognize that this is needed where we are hearing loud and clear from, from our residents and our businesses. The comment that I want to make that I hope you won't take as critical because I know that you're coming from the one department. It is not meant to be um, critical. It is, it is more of a broader governance statement. Um, I'm, I'm concerned uh, that we are looking at this, that this is what we're going to always need. And from today's viewpoint, that, that's where we are. But um, I'm really hoping that we keep our eye on the ball. And, and I want it on the record that we are focused on the other half of this issue and that we're not just getting comfortable that we're always going to have security so so there's a there's you know a higher governance thing here where where a couple of departments have to work together whether it be social services and security so that you know hopefully we don't always have to have this hopefully we can be addressing some of the underlying issues that are that's creating this and and uh you know i trust our trusted cao to figure out which departments have to overlay on that um because it probably touches almost every department uh, i agree we want safe a safe and a vibrant downtown and this provides the safety i worry a little bit that if this is what we have to have all the time 
does that take away from the vibrance of it? So, so just more of a governance uh, comment. I, I really appreciate all the work that's been done here. It's really been needed. I just want us to keep our eye on the ball in terms of let's direct the other side of that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Antosky. Uh, Councillor McCurry. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. Uh, through you to staff. Um, what we operate currently is a pilot project. Uh, we are going to continue to fund and operate the pilot project. When does the pilot project become a permanent project? Or will it continue to be a pilot project? Uh, th uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to uh, Councillor McCreary, the pilot project would end July 31st, 2022, with the approval of the recommendation and with the approval of whatever comes after being incorporated in the into the 2022 operational budget process through the estimates discussions. So are there more lessons to be learned and applied, or are we simply extending the pilot project because of available funding and budgetary um, ease? Okay. Through the chair, Councillor McCreary, we are constantly adjusting and, and, and learning from what we find out and in, in adding in responding to the feedback that we get. So the pilot, pilot project continues to be responsive to what we see on the street and what our guards and our team are experiencing. And we will, of course, bring that information into the SMS discussion. And can, uh, through the vision that we articulated through the report tonight, would continue to have a responsive and agile team responding to the feedback as we move Thanks, forward. Rick. Yeah, um, the capital funding envelope reserve, RFO 556, what other projects are funded uh, in 2021 from that, uh, that uh, bucket of money? I don't know if uh, through the chair, we can get that information for you, Councilor McCreary. I don't have that available. I see Joelle did come on screen. She might have that uh, information. Hi, Joelle. Uh, just very quickly through you, Mr. Chair, I was just going to provide the same uh, responses, Andy. We can get that for you. It's one of our largest capital funding sources, so there would be a number of projects that were funded out of there for 2021, but we can provide that. So the funding that goes to this um, item of work would um, otherwise be spent um, overcoming some of our capital deficits. Thank you. Um, now, we're going to be sending a copy of this to the Bradford Police Services Board. Um, is there any particular reason why we're doing that? Is there, is there an outcome we're looking for? Thank you, Chair Stas. It's just for their information because we do mention the special constable. So just to make them aware that uh, this would be coming in front of estimates with a report. And if there is any, uh, uh, any outcome there that we would need their support on, they, are, they do have that information in front of them. Do I understand correctly that uh, the city police also are um, looking at a special constable program? Yes, through the chair. So that's part of the answer as well for the six months, because coming at estimates, if we do see that the either this special constable or the Brantford police special constable does move forward, there is going to be that lag of six months of hiring, et cetera. And we don't want to lose security in the downtown core after making such progress. So that's the importance of carrying this program for six months. Um, now just bear with me while I go to page 40. So I'm very pleased that the janitorial company uh, is very pleased. And um, I, I read that they're, they're, uh, there's less poop, fewer needles, uh, and various other things uh, exhibited in our buildings. Um, and I'm just wondering if we have managed to provide facilities for those people or if they're simply pooping and shooting up on uh, private property now instead of city property. Uh, Councillor McCreary, through the, through the chair to respond to that question, the community and social services uh, team is working very hard to respond to the team, the people that our security team conducts wellness checks and passes on into that intake. I firmly believe that there are a number of folks that we have assisted into um, improved lives through this program, but there are still people who aren't responding and, and who will continue to find places to do what they need to do, even though the, they're no longer able to do it on city property as, sure. as effectively. So is, it, is it fair then to say that um, we've improved a few lives, but with respect to some others, 
we simply keep them on the move and they're a plague on um, a private property, some of these folks rather than city property? I'm, I'm not sure that I would characterize a plague myself, but I would, uh, they, they are definitely affecting private property when they're, when they, when they don't uh, stay on city property. So, so that would be a yes, then we, we move them along and they go somewhere else. Yeah, th thank you very much. And I, I will, I will reiterate that this um, certainly is a voluminous report uh, populated with some interesting information. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. Uh, Mayor Davis. Yeah, thanks to you, Mr. Chair. I've got a couple of questions. <clears throat> First of all, I think probably this goes to you, uh, Rick, through the chair. What's the difference between a private security officer and a special constable? Or whoever can answer it. So a private security guard, the main difference between a security guard and a special constable is that the uh, special constable can be um, authorized with police-like authorities. So essentially they have much more enforcement authority when it comes to all criminal matters, whereas security guards are have authority for essentially very serious criminal matters and the Trespass Property Act. That's the limitation of a security guard. And a uh, special constable has authority to enforce um, all criminal matters, the Highway Traffic Act, uh, Mental Health Act, the Safe Streets Act, Liquor License Act, a variety of other pieces of legislation that grant more enforcement authorities in a lot of the situations that our security team is encountering. Okay. And what's the difference between a police officer, sworn constable, and a special constable? So the main, the main difference there is special constables can be authorized to work, uh, to be employed for a non-police service agency. So they're commonly employed by uh, other government services and large institutions. So, and they're also employed directly by police service in, in many municipalities as well. Well, they... <clears throat> they have more extensive powers and they can also use more force. They can carry guns. Is that correct? Special constables, they do generally do not carry firearms. Um, they do have a much higher level of training when it comes to the use of force. Um, so there's definitely, uh, special constables are definitely more highly trained. Um, and one of the main, one, one other factor to consider is with this type of high profile enforcement role, special constables get compensated very differently from contracted security guards, which is also another factor to consider when it comes to um, loyalty, retention, and uh, level of training and experience in this type of role. Yeah, and through the chair, dealing with uh, costs. So the, to maintain currently what is being done for a period of six months, that's the $288,000, correct? And if you do it on an annual basis, it'd be about 576,000. And then you mentioned doing special constables, 930,000 per year. So would that be, to take the 930,000 plus 576,000 or does the, would the special constables replace the mobile security? Those will be the options uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Mayor, that we would be bringing forward to the estimates committee. But the, uh, the the model we're presenting is a mobile security team and a special constable team. So there there would be, depending on the complement between those two, some uh, rationalization of the, the two different costs. But the mobile security team uh, operated by the city, whether there is when there is no special constable option, or perhaps when the special constables uh, are up, are working for Brantford Police Service and have a different set of priorities, would stick at that five hundred and seventy six thousand. Yeah. So, we, so you, through you, Mr. Chair. So the what's happening right now is that 
uh, much of the work they do is at parks, it's housing facilities, not just downtown. Mm -hmm. It's taking care of the properties we want to provide security service. So, so if if the police should move forward with a special constable downtown beat patrol, how much security will we at the city need to protect our own properties? I mean, because we're not going to leave our properties with no security and just do what you want on city property. We always have to do some provide some form of security. So what on a longer term basis would you see the need being if uh, police services does have a downtown special constable beat patrol? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the mayor, we're looking at being able to have a mobile citywide patrol in that 570,000 citywide city for city facilities uh, at that $576,000 level would, would keep us where we need to be. Okay. Yeah, I have some other comments, Mr. Chair, but I think I probably burned up my first four minutes. <laughs> oh, Councillor Vanderstel, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, a magnanimous report, absolutely. Um, I, I'm, I'm caught by the incident of volume by location. And my question specifically has to do with the fact that at 2,665 incidents at the parkade, which is 48% of the total number of incidents reported by the team, um, are, are there, I don't want to catch anybody off guard, but are there any discussions in the background regarding um, the possibility of changing some of the security measures that are employed at the parkade so as to reduce perhaps some of the calls to that location, increase security on one or two or all three levels so that uh, it doesn't take up so much time and resources from all these calls that are going in. Because when you do the comparative, I mean, that, that's the biggest concrete elephant in the room. At, at first I thought it was an anomaly, but you produced the report. So it's, it's, it's uh, shocking to see that number, that it's equal to almost all the other locations. Is, is there dialogue, is there discussion happening in the background between our, our uh, well, thanks to uh, senior management team, uh, no more silos. Is there dialogue about what we might be able to do uh, to curtail that? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, there is dialogue. There's dialogue between multiple uh, uh, departments within the city, multiple teams within the city. There's also uh, capital work that is being planned to increase security related to camera coverage, related to access control, related to um, a number of the other areas where there are hangout opportunities and entry opportunities. So there's a, there, there's a lot of work going on uh, over the next 18 months to two years at the physical structure of the building to try and make sure that it's a little bit easier to, to uh, operate from a security perspective. And that, that would free, obviously, that would that would free up a lot of man hours and visit times to, or person hours, sorry, uh, to, to visit all of the other locations that you've listed here, right? That's correct. It would cut down on response times on the visitation uh, amount of time that somebody would have per site, correct? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I can just add one thing, Mr. Chair, through you to, uh, to, uh, to Rick Cox is the response that we, the city has just last week, uh, uh, Councillor Vanderstel just set up, we call them hot teams to deal with issues on, on the parkade as uh, we just established that last week, a group of eight people are getting together to talk about the parkade and the very thing you just asked about to try to, uh, cure, uh, cure some of the ills of that park gate. So that was just last week we got together and eight, eight people have been meeting and reporting back to our senior management team to try to deal with this issue as you just identified. Thank you. Um, where are we here? Councilor Ben Tilburg. Thank you. Um, what a thorough report. I just want to roll us back a, a year ago around this time when we were looking at the concept of having special constables, but the, the price ticket was too high. And this came up as an alternative, a short-term way to bridge the gap because we knew at that time, special constables would be at best six months away if we were to get them. And this is the pilot project and our results here, let's just look that we were dealing with, as described to me in a scene, particularly in the downtown and surrounding area, chaos, 
anarchy is described as a war zone and not just once and not just as a way to embellish things. The, the level of instability happening in the downtown was at a near panic level. That's why we're doing this. That's why the money was spent. And no, we didn't get, I remember at the time saying, sometimes you got to settle for half a loaf. I wanted the whole, but you know what? This is what we got. And look what we got in here. Look at these stats. Council McCurry's right. Everything that happens on public property gets transferred over to the city, over to private property. Look at what is happening on our properties. And that is happening on all the private properties. The same thing, same problems, and same volumes. So we have to spend this money and we have to move to the next phase. We have to be able to have some sort of security in the downtown with regards to special constables. If you don't have safety and security, the next thing you don't really have is a government, quite frankly. So you, you don't have an economy. Everything resolves around that. So, so this is what we had to get in order. I look at these, these stats and I'm, I'm absolutely gobsmacked and particularly important to me with security that can't enforce private property and yet it is 79% of these incidences were done on a patrol. 14% come in by phone. When we talk about 14%, now I know how many calls I get and calls that might come, I guess, directly now to you. That's, that's a lot of calls from those 14%. When I see what the patrols are doing, four times more or four and a bit times more on what they see and what they have to respond to. So I've got some things here. Um, I'm going to leave the parquet alone because that's been addressed. There are some ones that stand out to me, and I want to know places like the Beckett Building, Lauren Towers. Uh, we were having some serious issues over in Lauren Towers in that uh, earlier last year, and, or late last year and early this year. With the incidents that I see, and they're both similar in both buildings, are the tenants of our buildings, do they, are they appreciative? Do they feel safer? Are they seeing the impact? Can I, I see the stats? Uh, what's the impact within the buildings? Because I know I haven't been getting a call. That's, that's my impact. But if you could answer that question for me. And I've got a, another uh, question. The people that are down at Winston Court, uh, there's a significant number of incidents happening in Winston Court. I would expect some. I've seen a lot of incidents. And so a couple of things that come to my mind, uh, one of the statements made regarding the downtown was that they thought that the security presence um, felt more like a police state. And I'm thinking, well, would the Beckett building think it's a police state? Do people in Winston Court think it's a police state or do they think that this is safety and security that they need in order to go about their day-to-day -day lives? And that what we're dealing with are, are people that are, what our security is doing with is people that are uh, causing trouble and issues and disturbances and criminal activity. And uh, I would say that that's not actually a sign of, of a police state. I would say that's a sign of, of good work by, by the patrols. So, Councilor Van Tilburg, uh, uh, yeah, just, fine, but did you want to go down a second time? I, I will. Can I get out another 10 seconds here? Sure. With regards to the downtown and it being re re referred to as police state like by a certain group, is there any ways that we can approach that group, the pe people that feel marginalized or victimized that aren't causing any issues to feel as well, as safe as the people in our building? So I hope that uh, is clear and if I could get some answers. And would you like to go down for a second time, Councillor Van Tilburg? Okay. Councillor Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and just to, to note that Councillor Van Tilburg's time of five minutes Four, four others went the same amount of time. Just want to ask a question of staff. Uh, what is the training of security guards? What is the training that's involved? Make sure I put the timer on for myself. <laughs> Through the chair. Uh, our security guards are trained on the use of force, uh, the criminal code, de-escalation techniques, 
They also receive training in mental health and addictions. Uh, they're trained in first aid and the use of naloxone kits. So they have a variety of training when it comes to um, de-escalating situations and uh, the, the appropriate use of force when required. Um, and we're continuing to add additional training as, as those opportunities come up to, to uh, um, improve, improve our team and qualifications of our guards. Yeah, because in your report, you mentioned that the security guards are professionals. So could you give us some kind of an hourly training, give us a report on how much training of the security guard professionals that you've identified in your report, what that training involves, how many hours of training and where the training takes place, please. And going forward, uh, you, you mentioned that, that we use security guards at special events and one of them was filming. What filming would the city be doing that we would use security guards at? Could you give me an example? Uh, through the chair, the filming event security was related to making sure that uh, when the filming was being done at city facilities, that the city facilities were protected from uh, whatever might need to be going on. So as an example, when City Hall was being used for a film event, we had security on site to make sure that the building was safe from the film and from others. When you say the filming, is the filming the city doing the filming? Is this private sector doing the filming? This is a film uh, production company coming in and using our space to pr pr do their filming. It's not the city doing the filming. Okay, so are we reimbursed for that from the private sector or is the taxpayer paying for that? Uh, yeah, that, the, that charge was passed on through the chair. That charge was passed on to the filming company. Yes, that was recovered. Okay, great. Now you mentioned the software license owned by the current provider. Uh, how are we gonna rectify that going forward? That's one of your recommendations for going forward with this company is because they have the software. Would that be correct? Uh, through the chair, yes, that's correct. We would we would get our own software license and replace that function and provide it to the security team rather than having it provided by the company. Is it now? And that that limits our ability to get information we wanted. Are, are we not as part of the extension of this contract able to get access to that software? Through the chair, yes, that is the that is the expectation that we would implement that uh, transition through the extension of this contract. Okay, we have access to it right away. Okay, that, that clarifies that. Thank you very much. And someone had mentioned, certainly some constituents have mentioned about, uh, and I know councillors have mentioned that we're moving the problem on somewhere else. Uh, what what work or events have you been dealing with on the hotels along Cobra Street East, where we have so many problems of theft and break-in entering and, and so forth? Have we been doing anything down that way at all? Through the chair, that stretch is not within sort of the, the, the area that we've been focusing on, but we are uh, responding to inquiries that we can and uh, and supporting our constituents as we can. But the, the issue of the hotels on Colvin Street East is outside of the sort of the downtown focus area and then city properties that our team is focusing on. So when you could talk about the downtown focus area, did you also talk about Lauren Towers and, and were you over there at all? Yes, that's correct. Okay, please provide me with the map of the area. Thank you. My time's up. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. I believe everybody's had an opportunity to speak once, so we'll go. Second time speaker is Councillor Wall. Thank you, Chair Celeste. You're doing a great job. I have so much to say, it's a little time to say it. Um, I sent an email to staff with all that stuff I rambled about earlier, so I hope that that helps. Um, this is our home. This is our community and we all look out for one another. And I learned loud and clear when Eagle Place was dealing with a number of issues, what it means for a community to come together and take care of one another. And during many conversations uh, with the people of Eagle Place, which translated into many conversations with people from the downtown, there were kind of layers to security and safety in our neighborhood. And the first was people looking out for one another. If you saw something suspicious or you saw something dangerous or you saw somebody in the community who needed help, you called it in, you reported it. But the concern quickly arose was, who do you call? Do you call the police for every little thing? No, the police are overwhelmed as it is. They've got a job to do. There needs to be layers. So I kind of broke it down and I'm just gonna share it here but it starts with Neighborhood Watch and our Citizens on Patrol program. That program 
is complemented by our bylaw, our now security program, and the outreach team. And then ultimately, it ends with emergency services. Do you need an ambulance? Do you need police? Do you need fire? Do you need these trained professionals? But I think like, forgive me, because I respect all of you all, sometimes things just kind of get lost in translation with policy and procedure. Like at the end of the day, we're all just citizens of our country who should be looking out for one another. And it is people's job to be there when someone's in need or someone needs help. I hate the word police state. That's ridiculous. If someone was in our community and needed help, help should be available, whether it's a private citizen or a trained security guard or an emergency services professional. And I wouldn't want anybody to be anywhere in our city needing help and not know who to call. And that's what this is all about to me, is having somebody to call, somebody who will respond in a timely fashion so that everybody has an opportunity to be safe. And what I'm trying to figure out is the best way to do that. And that's why I was asking all these questions about whether or not it's sustainable. And my, my question, I guess the one that I emailed out and I'm hoping to have an answer for council is does there exist either quantifiably or hypothetically a future where a program like this is sustainable based upon positive economic impact? Can we prove beyond a reasonable doubt that having a safer community makes the community more prosperous? And honestly, it doesn't sound like rocket science. A safe community is prosperous. That just seems the way that it is. I feel safer when security's here. I feel safer when I see a firefighter. You know, people in uniform typically provide a sense of security, not a, a place where I feel unsafe. Sorry about all that. My final question, if you can, in the probably 10 seconds that I've left you, do we have a good working relationship? Does our security team have a great working relationship with the neighborhood associations, our bylaw department, and the emergency services and outreach team? Councilor Wall, through the chair, yes, we do, and we work on improving it all the time. Is anybody fighting? Are we all complementary to one another? Are we together, collectively, making the world a better place for the taxpaying citizen of Brantford? Yes, we are. Let's keep doing it. Thank you, Councilor Wall. Councilor Martin, second time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's there's a misconception out there, and, and it's even been uh, demonstrated by members of this council. It was mentioned here tonight. But the misconception is that we cut the special constable program last year to save money. And that's not the case. I led the charge on cutting that program because the police were not ready to implement it. And the major reason why they weren't ready to implement it is because the association was fighting the police tooth and nail on that issue. And so because of that, they weren't ready to proceed with that program. And I didn't see the point of taking that money from the taxpayers and having it sit there because the program was not ready to move forward. It was suggested to the police chief at the time that he needs to have this program ready to go for the next year. And I believe that's the case now, and I'll be happy to support that coming forward. But the misconception is that we cut that out to save money, and that's not the case. That was cut because it wasn't ready to move forward. And unfortunately, the misconception has been perpetuated by misinformation being distributed uh, after the fact and, and ongoing. And we even saw it here tonight. Somebody mentioned that here tonight. So I just wanted to clear up that misconception and get the truth out there as to what really happened with that. Thank you. Thanks, you, Councillor Martin. Uh, Councillor Van Tilburg. Be very happy um, looking forward to the next phase of this and the next six months and the implementation of special constables. And yes, I did speak with the police association before our estimates votes, and they were all on board for special constables, unlike what we might have just heard. So, and I have that in writing. Um, that being said, uh, I believe that we've done the right thing, all in all. We've done what we could with the resources that we have in order to address a need in the downtown, the community and surrounding areas. It is uh, not perfect. In fact, many of the businesses will tell you it's not perfect, but what I do know is that it is not ineffectual. It is actually effectual, effectual. The information found within this report, and I hope people that are interested in this subject and where our money's been going, look at this. It identifies a lot of things. It's filled, filled the gap that we've needed and uh, it's, it's proven itself um, a worthy pilot. 
whether we need this in the future or not, well, that's going to be determined by the activities going on in the community and how things um, turn out in the long run. We'll know once we start seeing special constables, whether, whether we are taking care of some of the problems or whether those problems are chronic. And that's gonna probably determine in another time um, whether this is, a, is this is the new normal. My, my thoughts right now are, this is the direction, we're getting there, this is the new normal. We've been chasing our tail. I know that uh, prior to getting our security forces uh, allocated, it was incredibly problematic for everyone. In fact, it's still problematic for those, but it, it, the security forces are able to interact with police services. They're able to help and assist getting people that are causing criminal activity off our streets. And we weren't able to do that. And we weren't able to keep our beat officers downtown either. Uh, we had beat officers that are the first that are called. The police have been overwhelmed from events all throughout the city. I have to wonder, you know, when people say, is this worth it? Well, I had to ask that question myself. Where are secure, where the security forces here working on our behalf, earning their keep? Was this a waste of time or not? It wasn't. It's a, it's a very good program. I, I want to, I'm looking forward to see what it blossomed into. I look, I look forward to us getting those special constables. Still going to be six months down the, down the road at, at the best. Uh, uh, training, hiring, a lot of things. That's what our private businesses and private citizens and private buildings downtown need. They, we need to have some regular style police enforcement, enforcing those kinds of laws on private property in order to bring that security to everyone. And so it's just not moved. But look at these numbers, they're significant. What people were calling in for before we had the security was anecdotal. And, and if that's true, and based on the calls continuing, that was only 14% when, when, when those people were calling in of all the problems going on in the downtown. So, cause that would have been continuous. People will continue to call. Catching people in the act or moving them from, preventing them from doing acts by your presence is a benefit for everyone. So I just gotta say, I hope, I hope everyone is supportive, um, supportive of the money, supportive of the direction, supportive of this report. Uh, while I came into this skeptical, I wanted to make sure it was had its value. I find that it does. Thank you, uh, Councillor Van Tilburg. Uh, Mayor Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, one comment about uh, some criticism that even seems to come from police services about while well, you're, you're, you're moving criminal elements or criminal activity off your property into other properties. So I'd say, okay, so what do you want? That we don't have any security and our properties become a generator of criminal activity? Then we'll probably hear, hey, you're not doing anything to control what's happening on your properties. Do something to control it. It's spilling over to our properties. In fact, that is what was happening in the parking garage. Because you can't rely on police to provide the kind of security. They just don't have the ability to do that to any property owner in this city to provide, you know, 24-7 oversight of your property. So like all property owners through the city, with the increase in crime, we have to do more. Each of us do more to take care of our properties as part of the solution to the security problem we have in our city. And that's all we're doing here at the city. In fact, you heard that uh, even if the police have a special constable downtown beat patrol, we'd still have to spend a lot of money protecting our properties and having the proper level of security in place. And the other, the other point that I'd like to make is that this having special constables downtown is critical, whether we're doing it or the police, because if they're sworn constables, they're highly cross-trained, they can easily be assigned to other policing duties and often are and have been because of the nature of the crime and the seriousness of the crime, whereas special constables are not as easily reassigned. And so if you have special constable downtown B patrol, whether we're doing it or the police service is doing it, they will stay 
downtown and in the downtown area and will not be reassigned. And in fact, it, there, is, there is documentary evidence of that having fact happened. And this was data that I obtained, uh, it's public data from police services. In 2018, the, there were 6,452 foot and bicycle patrol hours in the entire city. In 2020, that had declined to 620 hours, 10 hours a week. Now, I'm not being critical of police services. That was because the downtown B patrol would consist of highly trained, cross-trained, sworn constables, and the nature of the crime in our city has changed the last two, three years. It's more organized. There's more guns. There's more crime. It's more serious. So as a police service management, you assign your highly trained officers to where they're needed. So last thing I'd like to say is it's essential that we maintain this if you listen to the downtown property owners, and this is from a bank. Staff feel safer with, this, I'm quoting, with the city security team monitoring the downtown call. Each time we've called for assistance, we've been able to get quick responses. Calls to the police have responded much slower. Um, and they, they believe that there is little police presence in the downtown. That data that I just told you about confirms that. But there's a reason for it. Overall, the downtown core seems to be getting worse. That time goes on, especially little student traffic down here. There's no more student traffic. We feel if the city security team was gone, it would be a massive loss for the safety of the downtown. And that's a, a large bank downtown. That's what they're telling us. What more do we need to hear to support this resolution to maintain what we've put in place for the last year, for the next six months, until it's clear what the Bradford Police Services are going to propose on budget and what they can do and how we can then complement that in doing the security we've got to do in any event on our own properties. Common sense, I think, tells us we got to support this. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilor McCurry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, may I reiterate what a lovely job you're doing tonight. Um, well, I don't think it's a revelation that we have to continue to do this. And I, I, I don't see anybody opposing that tonight. Um, so, but, but I will say that, um, that I do this reluctantly um, and reluctantly because when one looks at the money we're spending on this initiative, it should and could be better spent elsewhere. Uh, and why are we in a position of having to do this? Uh, because of a number of failed, um, a number of failed decisions, I think. Number one, we've seen the province of Ontario overreact to the COVID crisis by emptying out remand centers, uh, by uh, being uh, nervous about uh, actually dealing with some of this um, crime uh, by way of remanding these individuals to custody. Um, if I understand correctly, we've got a very small um, cadre of folks downtown that are responsible for all of this activity. Uh, and these folks really should be in remand custody, and these folks really should be receiving treatment for their complex mental health and addiction, addiction issues while they are in custody. Um, and I think as well as tearing our hair out, for those of us who have hair that could be torn out, uh, we should be addressing this directly with uh, the province of Ontario. We have an opportunity to deal with them. We have a government currently which seems to be responsive to the inquiries and suggestions made by municipalities, but I really don't see any action by AMO or by municipalities to tell the province the way it is here in our own hometown. So we need to do that. That's something that has to be addressed. Otherwise, we just continue to throw away good money after bad to protect people downtown. And that's what we're doing is we're protecting people downtown. We're protecting young moms that have to cross over the sidewalk uh, to step beyond the abuse thrown at them by these vagrants uh, that populate the downtown. We, we see um, businesses who are driven out of the downtown because they've just finally had enough of their customers being harassed and their premises being soiled. Um, that is the solution to the problem that we have before us is action by the province of Ontario. Secondly, and this is something Councillor Martin and I are uh, bringing up uh, this week at Police Services Board, and I'm very pleased uh, that Council did, um, did grant me the opportunity to go back on the Police Services Board after a number of years, and Councillor Martin and I are looking very much forward to introducing some initiatives. One of the things that we intend to introduce is a community-wide dialogue 
uh, for you and the community to tell us on the police services board what your policing priorities are and what you believe the priority should be for the Bradford Police Force. Um, that's something that we hopefully will be onto in the month of January. Look forward to that news coming out as to how citizens can participate. Um, until we can right the ship, uh, we have no choice but to send this money down the drain uh, to chase uh, a very elusive problem, uh, which will not go away no matter how much money the city of Brantford spends on this initiative. Uh, it really does require action by the province to nip this in the bud. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. Uh, Councilor Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I agree with much of what my what the previous speakers have said. Uh, we need this program. Uh, I, I just want to ask staff, uh, the, the security problem that we had, uh, this is guarding our properties, but the residents that moved on to Market Street and the, sort of forced the business out of the downtown core on Market Street, did we do, were we involved in that? Uh, through you, uh, Councillor, or Mr. Chair to Councillor Carpenter, that was on private property and we were not able to assist directly with uh, that circumstance, although we were able to uh, conduct wellness checks and, and support uh, other interventions by city police when they were able to do so. So that, that would be a role if we had special constables then when we talk about special constables, that's what you're talking about. Would that be correct? Yes, that would be correct, Mr. Okay, all right. Thank you for that. I just wanted that clarification. Everything else has already been asked, um, but uh, we, we do need this support. We also, we need to do more than just to support the downtown core. We've got to support the rest of the city as well. And that may mean more special constables uh, and, and a larger program, but we do have to uh, deal with crime uh, in our community and make our community feel safe in all corners of the city. Uh, the downtown is important for sure. Uh, I've always been a supporter of the downtown and I'll support this initiative going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Carpenter. I see no further speakers. So Mr. Clerk, could you please take the, uh, the vote on this item? Item 6.1.2 cares unanimously on recorded votes. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Van Tilburg, Wall, and Toski, Marin, Sless, Vanderstelt, and Mayor Davis. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to 6.1.5, the non-competitive procurement of structural engineering of the Ava Road Bridge. Uh, and that was Councillor Utley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to, uh, to staff, um, the, the, the report uh, was excellent and scary at the same time. I've never seen good as that size buckle and, and um, so that, that uh, and the amount of rust, uh, rusted uh, components. Uh, it, it's a very serious condition. Uh, um, and I, I'm no expert at, uh, at these things, but I, I do have some questions about the um, construction itself, reconstruction itself. Will, um, will the bridge be completely closed for the period of reconstruction or will um, two lanes be open while two are being serviced? Through the chair to Councillor Atley, it is the intent to keep two lanes open at all times. It will be flushed out through design and phasing plans will be brought forward to the PIC. I, I'm pleased to, to hear that. And, and what about uh, pedestrians? Well, any is there room for to accommodate uh, pedestrians? Mm -hmm. Through the chair, Councillor Utley. Um, at this time, we have restructured the lanes to allow for pedestrian access. It is the intent to maintain pedestrian access as it is safe to do so. And, and thirdly, I've got a number of questions here. <laughs> um, will the bridge itself be widened so that there's good pedestrian access uh, either side of the, the lanes? Mm -hmm. The ultimate design for the bridge would include pedestrian sidewalks access which potentially does 
it requires the, br the bridge to be widened. And um, I would think the left hand, the westbound left hand turn onto Ava Road. Um, uh, uh, there's no way that could be maintained, I think, uh, during construction. We would we would like for that left lane left turn lane to be continued through construction because that does alleviate some of the yep. traffic issues that are yeah. exist with the two lane structure. So we will be making every effort to try to maintain that, but to ensure safety of the of the pedestrians and the traveled traffic. And then, lastly, Jennifer, um, will the will all the girders and other materials be ordered? Um, ahead of time so that uh, I, I know steel, steel is in scarce supply these days and I would hope that we'll have everything in place before we, we start doing the work. Mm -hmm. Through the chair, you are correct, Councillor Utley. We are seeing um, uh, supply restrictions from steel at this time. Um, we will make every effort to attempt to procure that first. We would have shop drawings. Everything would be required during construction. So shop drawings for the steel would be one of our first priorities. Um, I do have one more. Um, it is notification to residents in the area. Mm -hmm. uh, I would assume that that will be built into the process as well. Correct. Through the chair, we are looking at, we're anticipating public information centers throughout this process. Um, we will have phasing design, phasing drawings, all of the construction drawings available at that PIC. We will also utilize social media and our city's website to keep the, the, uh, the residents and taxpayers um, up to speed on the project. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Mayor Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Three to Jennifer. So these questions, I think I know the answer to some of them, but for the benefit of the viewers, mm -hmm. you know, I think we the perception was last spring when that lane was closed and the underpass closed, the hope was look at it, hopefully not too extensive. The repairs hopefully will done within a year. We wanted to put up with this bridge, part of it being closed for very long. But that's unfortunately not what happened. Is that right? Through the chair to you, Mayor Davis, you are correct. All right. And it's our absolute top priority to maintain safe bridges. We can't have bridges falling to disrepair and, and have the potential mm -hmm. of falling down. We just cannot have that, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what has been done is a very thorough engineering investigation of the status of this bridge. Mm -hmm. What does it tell us? Can you, can you yeah. summarize it, what it says about the status of this bridge and what we need to do? Yep, most definitely through the chair to you, Mayor Davis. Um, the enhanced OSM inspection that we had completed on the bridge, it did show us extensive deterioration of specific girders on the bridge in specific areas. So that included um, extensive deterioration of the steel, um, could be some in some cases about 50% deterioration of the steel and buckling of some of the um, girders. You can see those in the yeah. in the pictures. So a little bit more extensive than what we'd originally thought. Correct. All right. And so the repairs are going to take are going to have to be much more extensive, intensive, and take a lot longer than what we'd hoped for originally. Correct. All right. But we want to do this right. We want to make sure we're not doing it again in five or 10, 15 years from now. Correct. Through the right. chair to you, Mr. Davis. So, so how long do you think it'll be closed? Well, at least reduced access. Yep. Through the chair to you, Mayor Davis. Um, the anticipation is that we can expedite this as quickly as we can through design and through construction while maintaining two lanes, two safe lanes of traffic through the bridge, across the bridge. Um, the anticipation is we are hoping about a year and a half to potentially um, longer. Right. But that's what it's going to take to do it right and do it safely. Correct. Okay. And in the meantime, any risk? I know we closed the one lane because that's where the deterioration is most severe. Mm -hmm. Any risk to using these other lanes that stay open before we actually start the construction? No. Through the enhanced in OSIM inspection, the center lanes are safe. They are still structurally sound, those girders and the, the subsurface and the super, the superstructure. Um, it is only the edge lanes that have significant deterioration. Great. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, glad to hear that the work has been the intensive 
but the investigation has been done. Now we know what yes. we're dealing with, and now we're going to go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCreary. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, welcome. Thank you for this. Uh, so you've you've determined that um, that to, to repair the current structure is more expedient and more cheap than to to relocate the structure somewhere else to create a new bridge. Through the chair to you, Councillor McCreary, um, it is it would be significantly more expensive to replace the entire bridge in its current location. It has not been looked at to relocate the bridge to a, a different location just because of the the geographics of Brant Ave and Paris Road. Okay. Um, is there a truck weight restriction in place currently? Currently, no. Is there a plan to do that? The enhanced Dolson inspection did not indicate any weight restrictions in the center two lanes that we do have traffic placed on now. Do we still have the the weight restriction in place seasonally at uh, Lauren Bridge? Through the chair, you, Councillor McCreary. Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. Um, does it remove? Does it? Uh, does this involve the removal of the entire bridge deck? Through the chair to you, Councillor McCreary. Yes, it is. It's to replace the entire superstructure, which is the girders, the decking, and the asphalt work on top. And has there been consideration given to widening that bridge for future use? Through the chair to you, um, Councilor McCreary, we, we can look at that during the detailed design and have that flushed out. At this time, it is just to maintain the current, um, the current traffic counts and the current structure of the bridge, adding on sidewalks. I, I, would, I would strongly suggest that we consider that option. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking now about 2020, but there may come a point in time in the future when we have a light rail transit line, perhaps, and that would likely be one of the corridors we'd want to consider. Um, I, I, I think if, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, if we're going to consider a significant change to that, we probably should be considering a widening as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I may, through the, through the charity, Council McCreary, we will be um, providing the master servicing plan and all of our transportation master plan documents to the consultant. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to Jennifer. The, will any of the design work that's the new, needed for the bridge negate any of the work that was already done for the Terrace Hill intersection there? Through the chair to you, Councilor Martin. No, it will not. It was included all originally in an EA approximately 11 years ago. It discussed the restructuring, the realignment of the Terrace Hill intersection, as well as the bridge work. So short so answer, So any bridge work no. will be complementary to what's already been done? Correct. Good. Glad to hear it. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? Seeing none, could you please uh, take the vote? Item 6.1.5, non-competitive procurement for the structural engineering of Ava Road Bridge, cares unanimously on a recorded vote. Those members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Van Tilburg, Wall, Marne, Sless, Vanderstelt, and Mayor Davis. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. The uh, next item is 6.1.6, uh, year 2022 capital projects, funding pre-approvals. I believe that's Councillor Carpenter. You're muted, Councillor Carpenter. Thank you. I was going to ask the question about the water, but we did, I did that under the water budget. But I want to ask a question on this is a $14 million pre-budget approval. So uh, my question is, we'll see minuscule compared to, it's $100,000 on the River Ridge Silver Creek erosion assessment. I thank staff for that. But are the, is the River Ridge Silver Creek tributary, is, is that fully the responsibility of our engineering department? I'm sorry, Councillor. Could you please repeat your question? Yes, uh, the 
Silver Creek is a tributary that runs through this city through Brantwood Park. Is that tributary the sole responsibility of the municipality of our engineering department? Mm -hmm. Through the chair to Councillor Carpenter, yes, that it, that tributary is the sole responsibility of the city. And when was the last time we looked at it for erosion control or any damage to the to, to that creek or the stability of the banks? Through the chair to Councillor Carpenter, I do not have that answer at this time. Yeah, I, I okay, thank you. I, I don't believe we have, so I'm glad that we're doing this now. But will this eventually be able to, I know we're looking at the River Ridge area, will we, will we also be taking the responsibility to look at all of Silver Creek to make sure that the, the banks are safe and uh, we, don't, we don't have an issue because this is a stormwater management gathering system as part of the Brentwood Park. Will that end up being part of it? I see Mike's there. Mm -hmm. Yes, through the chair to Councillor Carpenter. Uh, the scope of work in the area that we're going to be looking at is from, sorry, I'm trying to think of the best way to state it, is from that Silver Creek pedestrian crossing to yep. the east end of, I believe it is, uh, it's going to include the River Ridge homes but it's the next crescent over. So it's gonna include that whole um, sloped area. So I'm just trying to think of the road here. I think it's uh, Linden Hill Crescent, sorry. Yeah. The east point there. of there, yeah. Okay, and and Mike, eventually what would be, what would be looking at all of the uh, Silver Creek eventually going forward to make sure that the banks are stable? Uh, we can definitely explore that, yes. Okay, and we also we also have an issue there. Uh, Councilor Tosk and I talked about the, some of the, uh, um, intrusion onto the public property and a way to access that property we get it, it can all be dealt with at the same time could it not uh we can we can definitely explore that is, that issue uh we do have uh multiple um drainage channels that we are including in with this work so we can definitely include that okay thank you for putting it here mike i appreciate it further speakers seeing none mr burke you please take the vote <laughs> Sorry, I overlooked uh, Council McCurry. Council McCurry, my apologies. Well, that's quite all right, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm looking at um, section 11.0, climate and environmental implications. Um, it, it indicates that there are no anticipated climate or environmental impacts as a result. Uh, does that mean as a result of the preparation of this report or does that mean as a result of uh, some pretty significant public works? Through the chair to you, Councillor McCreary, it is from the production of this report. So you you were kind to the environment. You don't have to plant a tree. Well, I did print it, so I, I wasn't, but I apologize. Okay. Um, but no, there will be environmental impacts in relation to the projects. When um, when will those be made known? Jen, through, sorry, sorry. Uh, through your chair, Celeste, Councilor McCurry. So we are working, um, there's uh, many projects that get approved through the capital budget estimates. So we're looking uh, to how to actually quantify the capital budget that will be prepared for your review in January and what those projects that are approved that won't have reports, how, what and how those are helping with our climate change action plan. Thank you. Yeah. Anything further? Seeing none, could you please take the vote? Item 6.1.6, .6, year 2022 capital projects funding pre-approvals, CARES unanimously on recorded votes. Members of the committee voting in favor as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Van Toborg, Wall, Antoski, Marn, Sless, and Van der Stout. Okay, that takes us to 6.1.7, 44 Elgin Street, uh, tractor trailer access improvements. I believe that's Councillor McCreary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I. My intent is to ask the same question of this report as the prior report. I, um, I, I don't believe I actually saw, oh, sorry, there we go. Uh, so it, um, the proposed driveway widening will not have any climate or environmental impacts. We are gonna be demolishing and constructing 
uh, new piece of driveway, is, is that correct? Through the chair, uh, Mark Jackman, Director of Operational Services. Uh, through this report, yes, we would be uh, reduced or we would be demolishing a piece of the uh, road there to fix it. Would that have any significant environmental or climate impact? Do you have to plant a tree as penance? <laughs> through, <laughs> through the chair, it would it would have obviously some minor. Obviously, there's some type of construction, but uh, it'd be very minor. Okay, so you you won't be sent to bed without supper. There's no penance to be paid. It's 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 immaterial, Mark. Through the chair, correct. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, could we please have the question call? Oh, sorry, Councillor Antosky. Thanks, Chair Slash. Sorry, I just slid in at the last second. I just, uh, you know, as our general manager just said, a lot of these projects were there. They're still working through this. This is a new process, and uh, quantifying this is these things are new and and not easy. So, um, I wouldn't say that. Um, any of it is inconsequential, and uh, I'm sure we'll see more of it coming forward. Thank you. Councillor Van Tilburg. This is 6.1.7, is it not? 44 Elgin Street? That's correct. Okay. I, this is with regards to tractor trailers driving up on properties of uh, property, uh, property across the road. And that happens whenever cars aren't parked in the parking spaces um, at the entranceway, uh, in front of the entranceway of the other building on the other side. So the tractor trailers tend to back up. And then when they can't get in, they, they go and drive onto the property. And it happens more than once and it happens when they have a spotter. And what the intent was, was to put these parking spots, take them away completely so that the residents can't park their cars on the street and that the company could get into the access to the port easier. But what, but my concern was that we were trying to address the issue of the tractor trailers driving onto the property across the road when they back in. Now, I do know that they were driving on their own property or on the on their grown grass and over that curb, but they're also doing the one across the street. So while you, you're you're having a, a fix on the one side of the road, there isn't necessarily a fix uh, for the neighbors. And while the report says, you know, there's there we're keeping the parking in for the other neighbors, and that there's only a couple of people complaining. Well, they happen to be complaining because tractor trailers go on the property. And I'd be complaining too, and that's where we were last week. So I would say that we've made progress. We're a little bit there, but I don't think we're we're completely where I feel comfortable in changing the parking bylaw with no protection available for the impact that it has, the negative impact that it has on the homes across the road where the tractor trailers go to. And while it's been said, oh, that was rare, or that was minor, uh, when I spoke with the company in previous in the year, they were to put out, send out people to watch the trucks, not have them drive on. And the fact is that they can be standing there and, and, and they still do. And that's not acceptable. And, the, and my problem is I understand how we got here. Uh, the people that helped create this road, like the road diet on an, indu on an industrial area was, um, Possibly not the wisest choice when you have tractor trailers trying to back into a main street road entrance way. And now you've taken the widths away from both sides and it's, it's, it has caused a problem. Um, I would hope that councillors uh, don't support in removing the parking at this time um, because it's not going to solve the problem that I have across the road. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's fair to, to the um, people that live there. And unless we can come up with a solution that I that that everyone can be confident with, 
that it does not involve uh, tractor trailers driving onto the property because because you can't have excuses. I already had the excuses. The, the cars weren't there when the problems were happening. They don't. They want the cars removed so that they can do exactly. They you know nine nine. 19 trucks out of 20 won't drive on his lawn, but one will. And that's over our new curbing. So I can't support this. And uh, and I hope we can come up with a little better. Uh, otherwise, it may have to stay the way it is with, with the cars still being allowed to park there because that happens to be the barrier that stops the trucks from driving on his, land, on his property. And quite frankly, during this period of time, while well, they've been parking there, while well, not while it's inconvenient to the trucking company, they have been getting their trucks into the into the area without hitting the parked cars or driving onto his property. Okay, next up is Councilor McCurry. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. And I, I do want to return to my commentary about um, about our need to comment on uh, climate change in every report that we see coming forward. Um, staff shouldn't be expected to tell us that there's no climate impact from producing a report and Mark shouldn't be required to come sit and listen to me ask him about whether or not he needs to plant a tree to compensate for a bit of asphalt pavement. So I'd like to see senior staff further develop and refine um, the specifics around when staff need to prepare a report with respect to the climate impacts. Um, it's not something that's applicable in most circumstances. Uh, and I, I really just think that uh, we, we really need less busy work around here. Thank you, Councillor Curry. Councillor Wall? Is this thing, okay. Uh, that is not a commentary. This technology in this whole new city hall is amazing. We're just learning how to use it. So thank you to the staff as we figure this out. This is not easy. Um, I'd like to defer this uh, so we have more time to consult with the members of the public who don't like this and to give staff an opportunity because I don't know that they were prepared for what happened here tonight. So I'd like to defer it till February next year. See could, a second. could you hold on to your deferral? There's one more speaker in the queue. Sure. Yeah. Sorry, Councillor Carpenter. I didn't see your hand. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor Carpenter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You are doing a fine job. I, I just uh, wonder, uh, does staff know how many loading bays are attached to this facility? Through the chair, I don't know exactly how many loading bays, but there's just the one entrance that they do enter and exit from. That's why they back end there. Yeah, I, I drove around this factory uh, and there are a number of loading bays. I, I hesitate to, to guess, but I, I believe there's over 10 loading bays that are attached to this building uh, where the property can be accessed fully off site, uh, accessed through Alice Street and into the actual property behind. And I'm just wondering why, why are we, the taxpayer, paying to widen the driveway for a private company is a question that I have. Uh, can, can anybody answer that? Through the chair, we're not actually widening the driveway. It's the boulevard and it's uh, the curb. It's actually the city's curb. It's within the right of way. Uh, and the more actually that they continue to go over that, there's more damage that will be occurring and we will have to get out there and fix it at some point. Okay, so we're taking responsibility for boulevards uh, everywhere. Okay, that's fine. I can I can deal with that. That's good for other parts of the city as well. Thank you. Uh, I agree with the uh, concept of deferral. I, I'd like to have, see some evidence that, this, that maybe the property is segregated off and maybe this piece of 44 Elga Street is a small piece of fact, it's not accessible from the rest of the property. And therefore this is the only loading bay that they can use large trucks at. I'd also wanna to bring to council's attention that Elgin Street itself, that overpass cannot be accessed by transport trucks. They cannot go under that overpass. It's not high enough. So trucks have to enter Elgin Street from Clarence Street, and then they gotta go back out the same way. So I'm just wondering why this whole difficult process of them coming down back again and then driving out the other way, is that necessary just to turn around? Uh, is it, uh, is it uh, we, we raised it several times to try and get the uh, under overpasses raised so that we could get transport trucks on Elga Street and off of Henry Street and off of some of our neighborhoods, but that was uh, to no avail. So I, I'd like, like to know what we're doing. So I, I will support uh, if a deferral by the ward counselors is, is what they're looking to do, I would support that. I think the constituents need to be consulted.
Councilor Wall, if you'd like to move your deferral. Yeah, I'm going to comment first, I think. Sorry. Uh, I stand by my statement. You're doing a great job. Okay. It is absolutely unacceptable for anybody to damage anybody else's property, period. And there's been damage to constituents' property by truck drivers. And I don't think they're doing it deliberately or intentionally. I mean, absolutely not. I think it's just kind of happening because it's a really complicated area, but we have to stop that from happening. And I'm sorry to defer this on you guys. I don't know what the answer is. I think, and I hope that there can be some more time to figure it out. So I'm seeking to move a deferral. You have a seconder. Your My ward mate, mate Councilor Van Tilburg. Thank you, Brian. Keep. There's no discussion on the deferral, so I'll ask the uh, clerk to take the vote, please. My question is, I guess, how long? Time and place. Nope. February? To the chair, sorry, to defer? Yeah. Like, how long would you like? How long do you think you need? I don't know. To the chair, sorry. Uh, yeah, we, we can uh, report back in February. Okay, thank you. The deferral of item 6.1.7 carries unanimously on a recorded vote. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Van Tilburg, Wall, and Toski, Marn, Sless, Vanderstelt, and Mayor Davis. We're now to uh, 6.1.8, uh, Ava, Ada Avenue and Palmerston Avenue, the full closure update. Uh, that would be you, Councillor Utley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all the residents who responded to uh, the survey that was put out by staff. Um, staff did a great job in um, commu uh, communicating with the neighborhoods and in both those uh, streets and areas. And um, the, the letters that came back um, really tell the whole story that um, their lives have been changed for the good. Um, you know, the children are safe to play now. Uh, people can take their dogs for a walk. And I, I, I think that's, um, you know, a really good success story. And I, I have to thank uh, uh, my ward mate, uh, Councillor Celeste, for uh, introducing this resolution. It, um, uh, I think there's still some fine tuning to be done with uh, snow plowing, where you've yet to go through a good test with a, with a heavy snowfall and waste pickup. Most of the comments that came from those letters, I believe, were um, the vast majority were, were positive about waste pickup and no problems from the uh, from the contractors. Um, the have we um, got in place no access signs uh, from St. Paul um, going down at, um, Ada Road and Palmerston? Um, because uh, some of the comments said that people are still driving full speed, not very often, but some people are driving full speed uh, to, to try and make a shortcut and then come to a, a rude awakening that they can't get through. I'm really happy about that. Uh, not that they're speeding, but I'm happy that uh, they, um, you know, they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. If through the chair, there are signs that the... Uh right out of um, Ada and Palmerston, right off of uh, St. Paul. I, I thought that there was, but I I, um, I just wanted to uh, find out for sure. And those that are looking in on this and um, uh, they, you know, the, they're happy. And now we, you know, go to the next stage, get a permanent solution in place and um, uh, people will be happy. And, uh, I think we all like happy citizens. So thank you very much and well done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Rodney. Uh, Councilor McCreary. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. And, and I'll uh, reiterate what uh, Councilor Rodney said that staff have done a good job on this and responded to the wishes of the neighbors. And um, 
the uh, ward counselors, I believe it really has improved the quality of life for a lot of the folks that live on that street. And I think that's commendable. Um, I, I do have one question of staff. Uh, we are apparently um, to spend no more than $100,000 on a design study. Uh, and I would ask, given the talents that we have within this building, do we have no one on staff that could produce the design for this street, which likely would save us $90,000? Through your chair slash Councilor Mercury, we've got great staff, but they're, they've got a lot of projects and a new capital budget coming up as well. So this project is probably best suited for a consultant. It's called the design study. It's really the design, but we do have to look at the intersection movements at Brent, St. Paul, understand how that impacts and what needs to change. Um, so it's probably better suited if we want to deliver it in the time that we need to, that a consultant be uh, procured for this uh, project. Eddie, thank you for that answer. Okay. Councillor Vanderstel. I did it. I turned it off. <laughs> so my apologies. Um, along with that study, uh, uh, Mark or Andy, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, are, are we going to make sure that we actually place a physical barrier? There's a couple of videos floating around out there uh, posted by homeowners about irritated drivers, I would assume, that get to the cul-de-sac as it exists right now and take it upon themselves to jump the curb, drive over the residents' front lawns and, and somehow make it out to Brand Ave. Um, we're going to employ a hard stop guardrail or something that is unmountable, I guess, uh, I hope, in the process. So through the chair, that's going to be uh, determined through the design phase. There's obviously other, th there's a lot of features that need to be taken into consideration uh, when it comes to that. So that would definitely be an intent and it will be something that we're going to be definitely looking at. Okay. So you did, you probably saw some of these videos, I guess. Through the chair, I've seen three videos. Okay. Okay, great. I'm glad you did. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's been suggested that traffic flows better along Brand Ave because there aren't people trying to make the turns on the Palmerston and Ada. Is there any uh, proof of that or numbers backing that up? So through the chair, we, uh, we've we done studies. There was a number of uh, illegal left-hand turns, which would just cause some queuing, obviously, staff would have to start drivers would have to stop. Uh, so with that, yeah, it definitely would flow a little bit better all the way to uh, the corner there at um, St. Paul and Brand Ave. Do you have uh, numbers from a study that back that up, or is that just uh, your opinion? Through the chair, it's it's through a study. Like we did do uh, traffic studies. Um, that just obviously, you know, shows that the cars are just flowing. Obviously, they can't make a left turn, so it's continuing to flow. So it's improving the traffic on Brand F. That's good to hear. Thank you. Okay, the Councillor Wall. That was quick. Thank you. Okay. This appears on its surface to be like a really unique kind of circumstance. And I've received and read commentary about like just how peculiar it seems. And I, I'm just curious if it is like, I haven't been around that long. Is this something that has happened elsewhere in the city or could potentially happen? Or is this a like a one and done kind of thing. It, it's just because Brian Ave is just such a heavily traveled route. Many people have seen this and it. I'm having a hard time explaining it to people when I'm asked about it because frankly, it's very complicated. And I'm wondering if you can shine some light on those comments. Just through the chair, it is a unique situation because the brand have is, you know, obviously a major road and there was a right into a residential neighborhood. And so there were a number of cars that were making illegal left turns. Uh, and then also using it as a through way to get across without having to uh, go through the lights. So it is a unique situation and it's definitely something that uh, so far has shown to be very positive in that neighborhood. So then complimentary to that question, is it expected to happen anywhere else? Are there, are there any other places in the community that have been identified at, as a site like this? I just think of like Mohawk Road or Greenridge or West Street or King George Road. Are there not similar type? 
So through the chairs, uh, there's everything obviously has its own unique situation, and we're going to have to look at each one individually. Uh, so we tend, from a traffic perspective, like to look at the neighborhood as a whole in order to look at it holistically, uh, and in order to make those changes, uh, the appropriate changes. This one's going to be a tricky one, and I apologize in advance. Was this something that was done by the city because it needed to be done? Or was this something that was asked for by the people of the community and done for them? Through the chair, this was done uh, through the community uh, and raised through the uh, two ward councillors. So I guess because I've been questioned on whether or not we're going to do this in other community in other spots in the community. And I know that that's complicated, but it's like this was something that people who live there wanted. They basically said to their councillors, we want you to do this. Staff went out and investigated, and it made sense to do it, so we did it. Is that right? Through the chair, yes. It did take, obviously, a few reports and a number of studies and a lot of staff time to look at this and look at the different options that were available in order to make this happen. Would you say that it was proactive or reactive? Through the chair, it was reactive as a direction of council. Okay. Go through a notice of motion. I'm all about traffic calming measures and making communities safer. And I, I do, in my heart of hearts, think that this was a community looking out for the best interests of its community, working with our counselors to come up with a solution and staff doing a great job of implementing what the community wants. Do I understand it? I still don't understand it. Do I support it? I think that as long as the ward counselors and staff and the members of the community are all in support of it, I have to support it. We... Let's get started in Eagle Place, Eastward and downtown with other creative calming measures. I can't wait. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Van Tilburg. Yeah, if I recall correctly, it was around 2004, 2006 that uh, those no left-hand turn signs went up. Uh, and that was to stop people from turning left and blocking up traffic. And of course, you always have somebody that doesn't want to follow those rules. And they still want to turn left. And it did block up traffic. Um, I got to say, I appreciate what the ward councillors here did in their first rendition when they came up with the temporary concrete barriers instead of spending all the money right, right off the bat and to check it out, see how it works. It appears to be working. And uh, I think the cost, what was the cost to install these temporary barriers? How much did that cost us? Through the chair, it was approximately ten thousand dollars just to put those two those barriers up across the road. That Through was ten. That's correct. That was ten thousand dollars. You know, uh, and I'm happy with those barriers. They're doing they're doing the job. They're doing what the community wanted. What I what I have problem with now is how much this is going to cost to change it. How much money we're going to spend? Uh, it was it was a road measure in order to reduce the traffic from going from Brant Ave to St. Paul. That's been done. A temporary measure gave us an opportunity that if we if we had to, we could pull them out, especially if it was not appreciated after they put it in. Uh, I think that was wise. It does feel like that they found a home there. And uh, and I almost think that that's the permanent home. I don't think there's any real reason. Because some of the things where you see people will be idiots and do idiotic things and you can't stop them. It doesn't matter what you try. I've seen those, I've seen the railway uh, crossing down at Ava Road and Hardy Road. And that's like Fort Knox as, a, as far as a road and, and barriers. And you people will still drive over things if they want to. And you're not going to stop them um, from being an idiot. Drive, if you put something further, find another way to drive on a lawn. Uh, there's, just, there's just people like that. But when I look at the solution that came forward, the overall benefit to the community, we spent $10,000 and solved the problem on two streets. I think we've done well. And right now with budget crunches, money is hard to come by. It's, it's $100,000 just for the study. Is that correct? Through the chair, the hundred thousand dollars is actually for the design. The design. Yeah, and all and there's a lot of things that would go into that design. And then we got to do the work. 
the chair that's correct yeah and so look at sticker shock i think we're getting good value for our money right now i think we're achieving a goal i think the community is happy i think we can save some money right now and if we have to if we have better times we can do this at a later date i don't think there's any rush to get this through uh right now if, if it's temporary and the thing is we can always go forward in the future and I think this is a possibly way to save us some money if we don't go ahead with any changes. That's just my opinion. So if I could, could I have clause B separated uh, so that if those who wish to, uh, who support what's there now, but wish don't wish to spend the money can vote uh, against clause B. Yes, we can certainly separate that when it comes time for the vote. Uh, um, up next. Councilor Hartley spoke first uh, to Councilor Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I applaud you and your ward mate for uh, dealing with this issue in the first place. This was a very difficult issue and it, it is reflective all over the community. Uh, as Mark has said, it, you know, it, this, th this does happen with people taking shortcuts through neighborhoods all the time, both directions on that street. And it's uh, made that street kind of a racetrack to beat the light uh, going both directions, actually, going on to Brand Ave and coming off of Brand Ave. Uh, another location would be uh, left turns on southbound lanes on Brand Ave onto West Street, which backs up traffic, which might be, need to be addressed further. This is not uncommon in a lot of municipalities. I've been to a lot of municipalities where I've seen uh, streets, uh, neighbor streets, where the end is blocked off with bollards or cul-de-sacs uh, design that, that actually makes the neighborhood whole. And I think that's what the board councilors here are trying to do. They're trying to say, look, let's make this neighborhood whole. Uh, but I think this model is something that we can start to use as an example, you know, uh, on our, our, our safety measures going throughout the city and other areas as well. So I, I, I don't think the money it w is, a, is a waste of time in the sense that we can use this example in other parts of the city. And I would hope that our traffic department would, would look at when we do our, our our five-year traffic impact study that we include areas where we can do this traffic calming and eliminate the uh, uh, road access and shortcuts that are going through neighborhoods. I think people see it all the time. Uh, making neighborhoods whole is also part of us making neighborhoods safe. So I, I think it's a good venture and I think we're on the right track. Uh, so I, I'm gonna support it wholeheartedly. And I think the, the ward councilor have done a terrific job here with, with the neighborhood. I, it's, it's the neighborhood that really come out and they supported them and that's our job, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Are there any other first time speakers? No, seeing none, I would just like to make a couple of comments uh, if I could. And this issue, we got 52 responses, which is, uh, it's, it's kind of unheard of that people take the time and send in what they think is, that you're doing. That 52 uh, responses to a uh, solicitation for a response is huge. At least in my opinion, in our ward, that, that, that's, that's a big time number. And of that 52 responses, 83% were in favor. So it, it's not like um, this is close. Uh, the, the neighborhood wants this. And uh, since that area has been brought into War II two, two or three terms ago, people have been asking for this and it's taken a long time to work its way through the system, but it's finally got to here. And, and, and I would hope it would carry on from here. Uh, that's my wish that that's my hope that's my plead i guess my ask to you to uh, to please support this because i think it's something that uh has been a long time coming and and it did take a long time to get here and uh unfortunately that's just the way uh, government works it, it does take time to get things through a system but we are here and we're at the point now of actually doing something actionable so i i would hope that people would support this and uh, i know my ward mate is dropping it a bit to uh, have more to say about this so uh I'll be quiet and let uh, Councillor Rutley, you got the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I would like, I, I really do respect and appreciate uh, Councillor Van Dilborg's uh, comments. We are tight for money right now. Um, but in the bigger scheme of things, um, um, you know, this is, this is not an awful lot of money. It, it may be more once we get the study back. I, I'm not sure. Uh, we'll have to see what that looks like. But, um, Many of the letters, or most of the letters, um, ask for a permanent solution. And I, I think the, um, 
and there was always that little nagging doubt sometimes when um, you make something temporary and that's it. It is temporary. And uh, future councils could quite easily overturn that decision and and um, uh, take it back to the way it was. Um, I don't think that will happen, but there's always that that risk. So I, I um, hope we get behind this, get behind the neighbourhood, support the neighbourhood. Uh, we really have made a big difference to people's lives just by this This $10,000 um, is way beyond um, it's, it, the, the value that that brings to the families and people that live on those two streets is uh, is way beyond that that much money in terms of peace of mind and a quality of life. And um, so I, I hope you will support us in this um, in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Otley. Uh, seeing no further speakers, uh, Deputy Clerk, if you could please take the uh, vote. Would you like to do clauses A and C first and then clause B? Sorry? Would you like to do clauses A and C first and then vote on clause B? Please. Councilman Tilburg, please. please. Through the chair, uh, we'll conduct the vote on clauses A and C first. Clauses A and C of item 6.1.8, Ada Avenue and Palmer Stern Avenue, carries unanimously on recorded vote of 10 to 0. Members of the committee voting favor are as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Van Tilburg, Wall, and Toski, Marn, Sles, Vanderstelt, and Mayor Davis. And now I'll open the voting for Clause B. Clause B of item 6.1.8 carries on recorded vote of nine to one. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Wall, Toski, Marn, Sless, Vanderstelt, Mayor Davis, those opposed, Councillor Van Tilburg. Thank you, Deputy Clerk. That takes us to 6.1.13, which is uh, Councillor Vanderstelt. It's a Southwest Community Center project, letter of intent. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. At the risk of uh, repeating myself, Mr. Chair, I, uh, I, I hope to see Council's uni unanimous support for this. Uh, it, is, it has been made uh, painfully clear over the last number of years, having to beg for space uh, in churches and, uh, and schools uh, for, for any meeting that would take place in the, in the New West Branch area. Um, it is a, a constant reminder that we don't have a space that we uh, uh, could use as a community space, um, which is uh, afforded to many other um, works in the city. And uh, I'm, I'm asking and requesting uh, support for this, and I'd like it to be unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Vanderson. Seeing no other speakers, uh, Deputy Clerk, if you could please take the vote. Item 6.1.13, Southwest Community Center Project, letter of intent. Carries on recorded vote of eight to one. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Van Tilburg, and Toski, Marn, Sless, Vanderstelt, Mayor Davis. Those opposed, Councillor Carpenter. Thank you. We're at 6.1.13. One four user fee and non-resident uh, review task force, uh, and it'd be that's Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A question through the staff: If I understood the report correctly, there's a reduction in the charge for the artificial turf fields. Through you, Mr. Chair, Brian Hughes, Director of Park Services. Uh, Councillor Martin, there's actually an increase in the fee for the uh, artificial turf fields. There's a What's recommended is a 10% increase across all field classifications. So okay. the artificial would be included and would, would be also increased. Okay, because there's a section in the report that talked about lower fees for the artificial turf. I was, I was confused by that. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the only lower fee would be the affiliated subsidy that sports and youth groups would receive, which would be 20% off of the adult rate. And that applies to the artificial turf fields as well, then? Yeah, yes, it does. Okay, and with the 
there was there was a comment from the track and field group about the the cost there, and uh, they they use the track as opposed to the field. Is there a separate charge for track and or field, or do they have to rent the entire facility? Three, Mr. Chair. There's no separate charge. They have to rent the entire facility. We don't base our usage on the activity that's taking place. It's it's based on an hourly rate, keeping in mind that if the track is being used, the field is out of use. You, you really can't have two going at the same okay. time. Now, that being said, I, I did read it. I, re I read their uh, their comment. I think they I think they had the wrong rate. The rate was actually lower than what they quoted in their comment. Okay. And if they're affiliated, it, it's again 20% lower than that. So I think it's just a clarification uh, that we have to have on their part. Okay, and this report is from the uh, non-resident review task force. And I noticed in the report that uh, Cambridge charges double for out-of-town users for some of their facilities. Is there a reason why we didn't look at uh, different rates for out-of-town users? Through you, Mr. Chair, the staff weren't directed to do that at this time. I thought that was the point of the task force that this came from. Well, what we were asked to do was within the report was to to uh, compare the fees from the users, from the uh, other municipalities, which we did, and, and then determine our, our profit and loss, our surplus and uh, and revenues to determine just where we sit as a, as a first step. And that's what we did. Okay, well, different, fee, different rates for out-of-town users be something that's coming in the future from this group? Through you, Mr. Chair. At this time, I believe the recommendation in the report is to move on to arena fees and compare arena fees uh, across the board and, and do a similar process, a similar study with regards to the rates and fees for ice usage. And at that time, at this time, that's that's the direction we've been giving. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Antosky. Thank you, Chair Sless. Uh, thank you for the report. It seems, uh, you know, I guess nobody's happy about an increase, but it didn't seem like there was a, a lot of um, pushback. People understand what's what's happening. My question, um, Brian, is around classification. And, you know, I've had this conversation. I'm, I'm going to use JC as, as an example because that's the one I'm more familiar with. I'm not sure if this happens across the town, uh, across the city, but um, classification seems to be based solely on infrastructure. If it's got lights, if it's got bleachers, et cetera. Um, I, I, I'm wondering at any point if if the condition of the field is taken in, into account. So, for instance, at JC, we have a drain, drainage problem. And um, so there's a number of days that it's not usable. And that's not because it's still raining, but, you know, lots of fields across the city are also being used. So, so two part, my question is um, total hours uh, usable. Does that account for the hours that really weren't usable because people are use, losing their their ball time um and and then the lips on the diamond so so you know we, we we hear from our residents or our players saying well we're playing we're paying class a diamond fees but i've got a lip on a diamond where a ball is coming up and hitting me in the face or we couldn't play for six games because the diamond didn't drain and that's mostly because of the clay so that's that's basically my question so through you, Mr. Chair, the, the classification of the field is, you're correct, is, is based on the amenities within the field. So it could be irrigation, it could be lined, uh, fenced uh, base paths, dugouts, uh, lighting. So the more complex uh, amenities, the higher the, the classification rate, and of course, the higher the price. It is not based on the amount of rain outs or the the issue as you deter, as you described with JC, where you have a high clay content in that area and the water tends to drain poorly. Uh, as a result of that, you do have more, more rain delays or, or cancellations, unfortunately, of, of games. Um, but in order to offset that, we would have to invest, obviously, some capital to, uh, to improve the facility, which is certainly an option, but, but then schedule it and, and, and not, not you know, schedule the time in to, to do the improvement. So when you, you consider the cost, and the impact of the actual construction, which might take the field out of play for a season, compared to the actual days it's been rained out, which I think were probably about five this year. It, I, in my opinion, it's about weighing the cancellations as opposed to the cost to, to make those improvements. So, um, and, and hopefully as we add additional facilities and, and additional diamonds, we can 
maybe redirect some of these groups to other areas. And it's unfortunate. Nobody likes to be rained out, unfortunately. And it's it, JC is probably the worst location for that, but there are other, other areas as well. Thanks, Brian. I, I guess COVID would have been a good time to, to do this, right? Nobody's <laughs> playing, but um, I, I just want to make sure that we're clear on the two different things. It's not a rain out, it's a cancellation because of the condition of our fields. Are those classifications, uh, our classifications, are those things that we've made? Is, is there an opportunity to put in another factor that, that, <clears throat> that um, and maybe this is done through you know what condition our assets are in um but as part of the classification uh if i've understood through you mr Chair, if i'm understanding you correctly put in the classification base is the rate of of, of use right so if if you're saying you want to bring it to a lower classification because of rain outs no not because of rain outs because the condition of the field is is not suitable to operate in the theoretical number of hours that are available. And that to me is, is up to the city to make sure that's happening. I don't think that teams should be paying, paying this, the same rate at a facility that needs some work. And that's up to us, absolutely, right? That needs some work as a diamond that's in perfect condition or a soccer field or a, I'm just using this as an example. No, I, I understand through you, through you, Mr. Chair. And when I compare JC complex to the rest of the fields, I think it's in pretty good condition. I, I know the rain doesn't drain as quickly there, but as far as the fencing goes, as far as the, the level of maintenance, it's it's the same across the city. Uh, if there's lip issues, staff get notified of that and we put it into our regular maintenance to reduce the lip and, and, and take that into consideration. And there's a schedule each year that there's so many diamonds that are done on an annual basis to, to do that lip reduction. So it's just a matter of stating it and, and, and getting it repaired. But as far as the level of maintenance, I think JC is one of the highest. I, I do believe that. The maintenance, absolutely. Yeah. I, I will, I'm not trying to ditch yeah. staff at all. I'm just saying we need, I think, probably to put some investment in that. And, and maybe it's the only one, just yeah. the example I'm familiar with. Thank you. Yep. Thank Three, you, Mr. Chair. Councilor McCurry. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. And, and I'll, I'll note that uh, the chair tonight is also the chair of the committee that, that brought the report forward. And um, I think the committee has done some very good work and there's more good work to come. And I want to thank Mr. Hughes for, for his responsiveness. At, at the committee meeting, a, no, a number of questions arose. One was to have a more fulsome look at our costs side by side with our uh, current and proposed uh, uh, charges. And I think that's very illuminating to see uh, in some circumstances, the city can actually turn a bit of a profit on these, but for the most part, uh, we do provide a pretty deep subsidy to groups. And I think uh, one uh, can only see from the responses of, of the survey that we did of the user groups that groups are very appreciative of, of what we do for them, that we have first rate facilities that are generally not always, but generally for the most part in superlative condition. Uh, and that's evidenced by the fact that there wasn't a lot of grossing about the 10% increase. Some of them commented that, that they'd rather not see an increase, but nobody had a negative comment about the value they get for the money that they spend. And, and some of them were actually quite favorable that they understood why we're doing what we're doing. And, and again, it's indicative of the first level of service and, and facility that we provide. Um, now, the other thing that we're gonna be doing, uh, uh, Mr. Hughes, is speaking to the owners of a baseball facility on Gilkison Street. Is that correct? Should this pass this evening? Yes, through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. And that's been laying fallow for a number of years, and it would probably be suitable to operate as a as a, a, a very minor field, a field that kids could use, right? Through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. Yeah, okay. Uh, again, I, I want to uh, extend my thanks to staff for doing this. We have the committee will remain active and we've got a number of further areas of investigation to pursue. This is an extremely good first start and it's a good template uh, for the remainder of the work that, that uh, Councillor Sless's leadership will bring us to. And um, hopefully we'll be seeing some more of these report every, uh, reports every couple of months uh, as we go forward into 2022. Thank you again, Mr. Hughes. Thank you. And Brian, I, I just got a question. The, the, the football folks, uh, commented that um, th they had two concerns. One was sometimes there's no one there to unlock the gate and, and they start late and, and then there's no one there to, to close it up. Um, they come later. Um, is that something we can deal with and address? Yes, definitely through you, Mr. Chair, definitely. And what, what 
what is in the ideal world supposed to happen is they're supposed to be there at all times when those facilities are being used. And with our with our COVID issue, we did have some uh, short falls in, in retaining staff this summer uh, and tried to do the best we could juggling staff from one facility to the other. But yes, we, we will certainly address that. No, it certainly hasn't been typical times. So no, we're, we're doing the best we can, and I think they appreciate that. And the other was the, uh, the grooming of the artificial turfs. Um, and, and some turf is loose. I think I read in, in the comments. Uh, do we have in the budget something that, that will uh, remediate anything that's done there? And I believe they, they indicated that the, the pellets should be evened out uh, a couple times a year. And the three I'm official. sure they are. We actually have equipment to do that. Okay. So uh, it, it is part of our regular practice of maintaining the artificial turf fields. Okay. And we have the skill set in-house yes. to be able to do that, do we? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. And I think that ends your uh, your last report to council. So thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. We'll call the question. Through, through the chair, just waiting on Councillor Vanderstone and Councillor Carpenter's vote. I, I voted once already. I can vote again. Sure. <laughs> Item 6.1.14 User Fee and Non Resident Review Task Force Report cares unanimously on recorded votes. Members of the committee voting favor are as follows Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Ventoborg, Wall, and Toski, Marn, Sless, Vanderstone, and Mayor Davis. Okay. 6.2.2 is gold recognition for the city and the Grand River watershed uh, wide uh, wastewater optimizational program. Uh, I believe that's Councillor Utley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say congratulations to staff. It's uh, great work and, um, um, you know, you, uh, you deserve the accolades that uh, go with it. You quietly perform your jobs very efficiently, very effectively. And um, it's come back. Do you get an Oscar or uh, something like that for the uh, gold award? Yes, no. <laughs> anyway, well done, Sylvie, and to all your team. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Utley. Uh, Mayor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and this, Councillor Utley is right, this is a big deal. And for the viewers, just so you understand what this is, it's it's a group that uh, has the 30 wastewater facilities in the Grand River watershed with the GRCA coordinating a lot of this. And it's a group that's a supportive group. They, they help one another, the intent being to improve the wastewater facilities throughout the watershed so that we're reducing the impact that urban areas have on the watershed. And they've made great progress over the last 20, 30 years. And they have a, an annual rating. They look at a number of different factors. In the past, the city has been consistently uh, in the top five rating, a silver rating. And so to get a gold rating, you have to be at the very top level of the uh, wastewater treatment facilities in the watershed. It's hard to obtain, and you only get there through a lot of hard work and determined effort. And this is a great testament to the, the work of Selvi and her staff. I think it's something we can be justifiably proud of that our wastewater treatment facility, which I know many times we don't really want to think about it. You flush the toilet and you think it's taken care of. Well, it's being really well taken care of to the extent that we're actually getting a gold star for it. So, and as a person who spends a lot of time in the Grand River recreationally, including uh, fly fishing, I know the impact uh, firsthand that, uh, that the watershed and water treatment facilities can have and how important it is that to what we have in our watershed be the best possible. So. It's again, thanks very much to staff. It's, uh, it's great to get this gold start. Hopefully there'll be more to come. 
Thank you. Councillor Carpenter. Yes, you know, uh, as a member of the GRCA, we're, we're, I think the mayor and I were both proud that this uh, came up, that uh, we've been recognized as the gold star here. Uh, and it, it encourages other municipalities to do better too. And, and you should know in the criteria that we didn't just meet some requirements, some voluntary requirements, we exceeded them. And it, it uh, is very important to recognize the value of the GRCA and what we're doing as, as uh, examples and leaders in, 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 along the GR Grand River watershed for others to be involved in. One only has to look at British Columbia and see what's happening there without a watershed management system throughout the province like we have on the Grand River watershed here uh, to protect us from such, such uh, extensive 100 year floods. So, uh, you know, those that, we, that haven't experienced flooding here, you don't experience it, you don't realize and we need to thank GRCA and the role that we play as a municipality in our technical advice to them as well. So thank you, Selvi, and your department, and congratulations to all. It's something to be very proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Carpenter. I'll come to Councilor Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's uh, important to note as well that uh, our staff do an excellent job. When you look at the number of spill reports we get from communities upstream of us, unfortunately, they're not all doing as good a job as, as our staff are. And uh, it's our water treatment staff that have to deal with that sometimes. And, and that staff does an amazing job as well, which is why we have safe drinking water on a regular basis. Uh, but our wastewater treatment staff make sure that the water that uh, goes into the river from our facility is safe for all the communities downstream. And we never have to notify communities downstream that we bypass sewage or that we uh, allowed something into the river that, that shouldn't have been. So our, our, our staff did an amazing job and it's nice to see them recognized for that and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Having said that, could we take the vote uh, please, Deputy Clerk? Item 6.2.2, gold recognition for the city in the Grand River Watershed Wide Wastewater Optimization Program cares unanimously in recorded votes. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Van Toborg, Wall, and Toski, Marn, Sless, Van der Stelden, and Mayor Davis. Thank you. Uh, our last item for consideration is 6.2.3, Climate Change Action Plan and Emissions Inventory Annual Update. I will start the clock because I imagine Councillor Ryan Toski's got a lot to say. So you're up. Thank you, Chair Sless. And I may break it into two, but I am going to ask um, our climate change officer a couple of questions since she has um, likely sat through this waiting for this because I told them I was going to separate it. Um, so if there's Rochelle. Um, thank you for the report, Rochelle. I'm going to have some comments after, but, um, you know, one of the things that we noticed, um, we did see some reductions because of COVID. It was kind of a gift, but even with those reductions, we still are not on target for uh, our goals. And so I think that um, that in itself is a success that we're measuring things. We now know where we are. We know what we need to do. Uh, and you've really, you've been stumped kind of in terms of getting the community um, climate action plan going because we can't have the engagement. Um, but when, when we can get things moving a bit more, and I know we've got some more movement on the corporate one, what do you think are the, the um, first things or the, the quickest things that will make the biggest impact uh, from the community for us to start really attacking these goals? Through the chair, uh, Rochelle Remini, climate change officer. Um, that's a great question. We've been doing some engagement uh, over the past year uh, with uh, an advisory group on some initiatives that we can get bring forward in the community plan, although there's still more engagement to do. Uh, but certainly I think one of the, the first things that we need to look at is uh, community education and awareness, um, making sure that the community is aware that we have a climate change plan and how um, individual actions contribute and how they can start making change to, to produce emissions. So I think that education awareness piece is something that we need to look at um, early on uh, and then look at um, pieces for reducing, helping uh, homeowners reduce emissions from their home and uh, offer transportation alternatives and some, some tools in that area. Thanks, and from the corporate side, uh, actually, I, I, I wanna congratulate you on this because through uh, FCM, we've been a member of the um, Partners in, in Climate 
change. I think that's what it's called, PC. Sorry, you can correct me. But anyways, we were one of the first um, communities on board with this, um, and we have never met one of the five uh, milestones, and we signed on in 1996. Uh, since Rochelle has been here on the corporate side, we have just achieved level three of the five. So um, next is implementation, I believe. Where, what, what's, the first, uh, what's the first and biggest hit on the corporate side uh, on the impl Im implementation plan? Uh, through the chair, sorry, you're asking what, what we've accomplished to reach milestone three? Or how okay. are we going to work towards milestone steps. four? Let's yeah, since we're still not reaching our goals, where, where do we have to get aggressive? Right. So uh, with uh, to reach milestone four and five for the corporate um, path, uh, we are doing the work that's required right now, but it does require, you know, a, a, a year or two of, of work to show that we're continuing to implement the plan and continuing to monitor. Um, so we'll be seeking those uh, next two milestones uh, possibly next year or the end of next year. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and Rochelle, I just really want to thank you and all of the teams that have worked on this because this is really uh, something that's being looked at across the organization. It's very new for a lot of the departments. There's a lot of technical work in here and there was a lot of research that uh, Rochelle had to do because it just, we hadn't been doing it before. So we've got baselines now and um, I look forward to what you bring forward for us and um, I'm really happy to see that our corporation is uh, on board and moving forward and doing what we need to do because I believe that our, our residents expect us to do this. So thank you so much to you and your team. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right on cue. Seeing no further speakers, uh, Deputy Clerk, could you please take the, uh, the vote? Item 6.2.3, Climate Change Action Plan and Emissions Inventory Annual Update, CARES unanimously on the recorded vote. Members of the committee voting favor as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Van Toborg, Wall, Antoski, Marn, Sless, Vanderstelt, and Mayor Davis. Takes us to resolutions. Uh, the first one, 7.1, .1, representative for FCM Cannabis Committee, uh, and that's uh, you, Councillor Antoski. Could you please read your resolution and do you have a seconder? Thank you. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Wall. Whereas the Federation of Canadian Municipalities has passed a resolution to call on the Federal Minister of Health and, Eternal, and, and, and Attorney General to establish a committee of local governments, including representatives from rural municipalities, to work together to propose amendments to the Cannabis Act that will remedy the problems experienced by municipalities as the result of the Cannabis Act and Health Canada's administration of the medical reg uh, registration re regime, which we have in Appendix A. And whereas the City of Brantford has passed a resolution on nauseous odors in the municipality, that's Appendix B, and now therefore be it resolved that Councillor Carpenter be named as a representative of the City of Brantford on the proposed FCM committee to recommend amendments to the Cannabis Act. And if I may brief briefly speak to it, uh, Chair Suss, thank you. Um, as, as sitting on the board for FCM, this is an issue that has come up in many municipalities across Canada and members may remember uh, that we certainly have had an issue on Brock and there seems to be a little bit of a I, I, I hesitate to say a little bit but there's been a gap in terms of the federal government's re, um, regulation for the the um, the medical uh, piece through the health through Health Canada, and it's really created some issues, and it ties the hands of communities, um, municipalities, in terms of being able to address them locally. Uh, in fact, the, these were this locally there, and in other municipalities, they're approved before we even see them. Um, it, it, we were all shocked by it. So um, the reason that uh, Councillor Carpenter has been named in this is he was really a lead on the issue that we've experienced in Ward 4. He's done a lot of research. He's got the stats. He's 
been involved with the police. So um, in my mind, he's got uh, the most information on this issue um, and can represent our community and bring the knowledge and, and the pieces that we've learned locally um, to help across the, across the country. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Antoski. Uh, Councillor Wall. Thank you, uh, Chair Sless, and thank you, Councillor Antoski, for allowing me to second this. Uh, as a municipal representative, I think there are a lot of nice things you could say about Councillor Carpenter. Um, and one of those things would be his diligence to his constituent work. And the people of Brantford are frustrated with the way that the cannabis legislation has been rolled out. We've all received so many concerns and emails and calls and posts on social media and articles in the newspaper. And if there's anybody who's gonna go there and make sure that the people from Brantford are heard on that and uh, to hold them to task it is Councillor Carpenter and uh, he's going to serve this city well on that committee and I wish him nothing but luck. Thank you Councillor Wall. Uh, Councillor McCurry. Mr. Chair I have an amendment which I'd like to introduce when you uh, think appropriate. So uh, go ahead. Uh, let me say I support this of course as well but um, uh, Mr. Chair, given our discussions around climate change this evening and previously, my amendment would read that um, attendance by City of Brantford uh, representatives on the proposed FCM committee be restricted to remote electronic attendance only. Is there a seconder for your, your amendment? Councillor Utley, did you want to speak to that? Uh... No. We have an amendment on the floor. Do we have any speakers? Councillor Wall. Thank you, Chair Slash. I get it in principle. Uh, I'm just worried about, I just like maybe like a friendly amendment as long as that doesn't prohibit, like as long as that doesn't go against what their rules are. Like if you have to attend it in purpose, person, for whatever reason, I wouldn't want that, that very strict wording that was added to suit, like to prohibit him from being able to do it. So as long as they offer the option for it to be a virtual thing, I'll support this wholeheartedly. But if that's not an option, that makes sense. So I'm hoping that's friendly. Mr. Chair, no, I, I would think that if, if there comes a point in time when it's not possible because of their regulations, this should come back to us to be amended at that time. Councillor Antosky. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Chair. I've been thinking this through. I have the same concerns as Councillor Wall does because uh, we don't yet know what the mandate is. I know that um, you know most organizations are are um, open to, to hybrid attendance, um, but I would hate to to prohibit it. Um, I guess I'll ask the clerks this. Uh, if we passed this amendment this evening, um, can, can we change that after as an, an amendment or does it have to be a reconsideration? Through, through the chair, uh, what's your timeline? If it gets approved tonight, are you, is your question for, can you amend it at council in December? It may be beyond council. Uh, we're waiting for for the dates. Then the I would suggest that the motion that you would have to provide is the motion to amend something previously adopted, as opposed as the as opposed to the the um, reconsideration. And so, motion for something that's been previously adopted can be brought forward by anyone, any member. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Van Tilburg. I'm a bit puzzled. I don't know why this is, and if that's going to be the case for everything that we do, always. Does that mean, yeah, like it, it, it's, uh, I think I like having the flexibility that that potential is there. There's also a potential when, like I said, I don't know how this is being applied. Is this a one-off deal for one reason? Or is this what we're going to do? And, it, it, and because 
quite frankly, um, sometimes you're far more effective in person than on a Zoom meeting. That's just a fact. There's something better about being in person. I think we all know that. I think we felt that in the council team. I'm sure you feel that there now. I don't understand why um, this is the, the way. Um, I just I just don't. I'm and then <laughs> I just having a hard time wrapping my head around this. Like I said, if that's the case, then everybody shouldn't be, I don't know, driving to council, uh, shouldn't be going to the county for meetings, shouldn't be like I, I don't get it. Uh, we have other meetings that go outside, so maybe that information will come, but right now it's uh this is more puzzling than it, it, to me than anything else. Councilor Carpenter. Uh, yes, uh, it is puzzling, but, but I can tell you that uh, I prefer uh, Zoom meetings. Uh, as you can tell, I'm here on Zoom now. I prefer uh, that for a number of reasons, for uh, for the pandemic, for one, and, and to save time. I think there's an opportunity to do hybrid meetings in a lot of locations, um, but I don't think we've done that same amendment to police services board members of council that go to police services boards or other committees. Uh, uh, as the councilman Tilburg has said. So I don't, I don't think the, the amendment is necessary. I can just tell you though, that I would be attending uh, virtually whenever that was possible. If it wasn't possible by the committee, then I would have to attend by the committee's rules. Uh, I would certainly be bringing updates back to council on a regular basis. And if that was the new rule, I would make you aware. So the amendment really isn't necessary. And I'd ask council not to tie the hands at this point. Uh, I will certainly keep you informed. Thank you. Well, I won't support the amendment. Any other first time speakers to the amendment? No. Councilor McCurry, for a second time. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll wrap on it if you have speakers ahead of me in the queue. So that would be uh, Councilor Antosky. Well, there we go. Thanks. Uh, given that there's, you know, there's some offense here, um, I would prefer to not pass this amendment. I, I think that we need to leave it open. As Councillor Carpenter said, he does prefer a virtual. Um, I do believe that there will be that option. I just don't have that clarity. I understand that from a, from a process perspective, it could come back, but it's too easy for that to get missed. Um, and so I'd rather just take care of it here and make sure that, um, that we can be represented and that the what we've learned here can be shared with other communities how, however that needs to happen thank you okay I, uh seeing no one else i'd just like to chime in um I, I i have no problem not supporting the amendment i i just um it would have to be funded somehow uh, if there is travel expense involved and it's not covered in the uh in the resolution but it shouldn't be coming from a, a councillor's um what our expense fund or whatever it is, it, I don't think that's for that. Uh, for FCM, we have a, a fund that we fund, uh, and for AMO, we do the same thing. And I would think this would fall under that category. So I, I would ask the mover, if, if you can identify a, a funding source or whether it comes from, I, I'm not sure where it comes from. We would probably have to talk to the uh, the treasurer, but but I, I do think it should be covered off in here because I don't think it should be coming out of one individual's uh, funding mechanism. I agree, and I, I would need confirmation from our treasurer, but I believe that it could come from the FCM account. We do have an account specifically for that, but we would have to see if the wording states specifically that it's to the board member. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing no further speakers to the amendment, uh, Council McCurry, you wish to wrap. So, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Um, well, I, uh, you know, I'm not sure why there um, is so much trepidation. Um, we we uh, have to have our staff report on every item now with respect to climate change, and I made that point earlier in the evening that some of this is um, some of this is is, is is a bit much. But here we have a dedication uh, by a councillor to contribute to this dialogue on cannabis. But I'll note that we do have two councillors who are not present in the room tonight. One of whom said, uh, in opposition to the uh, amendment that you're more effective in person. Um, and I would say that um, that's not proven tonight, certainly as we have two folks at home for whatever reason, they're at home and not appearing before us uh, and that's their right.
But I think as a council, we have the right to dictate um, our commitment to climate change. And I think that includes not driving across the country or across the province or flying to attend meetings um, on behalf of this municipality. So if you think we've got a climate emergency, if you think it's important to us, then you should be supporting my amendment tonight, the seconded by my friend, Councillor Utley. Um, walk the walk. Otherwise, uh, it's just all empty rhetoric. Here's your opportunity to, to, to do that. Um, it's not gonna save a lot. It's not gonna save the planet, but um, it's something. And I think if you wanna agree that there's a climate emergency and we all did that, let's, um, let's, let's do that tonight. As was discussed, if we find out that this is not possible, Councillor Antosky will bring a resolution at a later date to to um, to change something that's already been agreed to. But I would appreciate everybody's support on this tonight. Um, otherwise, um, you know, why do we bother with the climate change initiative? Then we'll call the vote on the amendment. The amendment to item 7.1 is lost in a tie vote. Members of the committee voting in favor of the amendment are as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Marne, Vanderstelt, Mayor Davis. Those opposed to the amendment are as follows. Councillors Carpenter, Van Toborg, Wall, Antosky, and Sless. Okay, so to the amendment as presented, are there any further uh, discussions? Seeing none, we'll call the uh, vote on the resolution. Sorry, Councillor Wall, you're sitting down there so quiet and patient. It's my oversight, please. I don't know that anybody has ever described me as quiet and patient. <laughs> so that sparked some really great conversation. And I'm wondering if prior to the council meeting, we could have um, staff provide us with some information, like I get what was tried to accomplish there with the amendment about traveling. Right, like if you can do it virtually. And if we're gonna do this, let's roll it out, right? Why aren't we doing everything virtual? You know, I don't know that ever like our regular committees, heritage committee and tourism advisory committee, library committee, I don't know if we're ever gonna go back to meeting in person because honestly, there are people who would just find it easier to not have to drive all the way from wherever they work to get to a meeting on time and whatever. So I think there's value in looking at the environmental impact of not only representatives of council going to these committees and meetings all over the place, um, but staff too, because it's said in the whatever. I think I've made sense. I'd like to see it before council because if I'm not wrong, just because that amendment got defeated here tonight doesn't mean that it couldn't come back at council meeting in some form, right? Chris? Yeah, do the chair, that's correct. So I'd like to see more information about it because I didn't support it tonight, but if it makes sense and it's going to help save the environment, I will support it in the end. Um, I just need it to make sense and we didn't have enough time to make it make sense tonight. So, or, oh, yep. Hello? Okay. Hi. Thanks for introducing that, McCreary. Uh, I can't wait to see Councilor McCreary where it goes. Mr. Hutchins, did you want to uh, comment? Can I just ask for a point of clarity, Councillor Wall? What are you looking for to come to this council, like as in, as two weeks tonight? What are you looking for, just on this specific issue or the broader traveling issue? Uh, that's why you, you said two things in there. I just want to make sure yeah. I'm clear. Thank you. Um, I'd like to know last, well, okay, pre COVID, I guess, how many kilometers were put on a vehicle to get councillors and staff to meetings? like an estimate or as best you could do, but like I drive to the tourism center up on Wayne Gretzky once a month for the tourism advisory committee meeting. Like how, uh, what is the, I don't know how to ask you what I'm asking. What is the environmental impact of staff and members of council driving to committee meetings, uh, whether they're locally or at uh, other cities or municipal? Yeah, this is complex. Okay. Okay, that might be, uh, yeah, that's pretty broad. We'll, we'll try to put something together, but that's, you know, 
the time we do something for council, that's a week. It's less than a week. That's a pretty big ask for get something for the next council. But I just, and in just, fairness, yeah. if you need more time to do it, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor Vanderstel. Well, full marks to our IT and clerk staff because you put us on the cutting edge of hybrid meetings during a pandemic with the threat of global warming. Well done. Well done. But the cutting edge is interesting because what it does is it presents us an opportunity to take the right action at the right time. The reason I supported it is because it's obvious that, well, it's odd to be speaking to the amendment when it's already failed. But the reason I supported it is because it's a question we must ask ourselves about how shall we then live going forward. And the reason I, I'm glad it failed it was because it's not a unanimous decision based on all aspects of hybrid meetings. We don't have all the answers yet from all of the organizations and individuals and uh, and support bodies that we should have. So we can, we cannot make a unanimous decision based on the information we don't have. But in principle, I thought I would never say this after my first term in council, but in principle, I'm inclined to agree that it's a decision that we'll have to make. We'll have to ask ourselves those critical questions of how shall we then live? It's a difficult question to answer. And I, I thank Councilor McCurry for bringing it up uh, tonight. And I, I hope to see where it goes. Thank you. The Councilor Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, what some people didn't really take into consideration during the amendment is there's a world of difference between a five minute drive from my house to the tourism center or, or a 10 minute drive downtown to, to attend a meeting here and a drive to Ottawa or a flight to BC. It's, it's a world of difference. It's, it's not point comparing, you know, should we all go virtual for all our meetings? What we're talking about is travel to other cities, possibly to other provinces. We don't know where this committee is going to meet. So I think uh, I think that aspect of it was lost on people that voted against the amendment. I just wanted to make that comment. Uh, Councilor Antosky. Thank you, Chair Slesa. These are all valid comments, and we are in the middle of you know, opening up into a new world. And I completely agree with the comments about the environment and sustainability. The reason I voted against it is because at this point we don't know. So do we just decide to not be at the table of an important issue? And so I think that we are going to move, um, not just us, but across the country to uh, being able to have hybrid options. It just happens that we seem to be ahead of the curve here because of our IT staff being and our clerk's department and making this happen. So, um, and as we've heard, um, you know, the choice will be hybrid, but, but if we just say you can't go unless you're doing it virtual until all of our organizations get this lined up and figured out, then we're going to lose a seat at the table. So I think that we can come back and say, hey, for this instance, this is what the plans are. These are where the meetings are. And yes or no, you can meet uh, virtually. Um, I think it's a bigger issue on the whole policy in terms of how we move forward. But uh, I don't disagree with what's being say said. I just... I, I think that, um, you know, we can weaponize the whole environmental climate crisis. That's not what it's intended to be. We just, we all have to take a step, one step at a time and, and, and let's push the envelope on that and make it, make it uh, work and, and be leaders on that moving forward. But right now we're in the middle ground. So I think we can come back with those answers by council for this specific issue. Councilor McCurry. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, well, I, I guess largely this uh, involves us trying to put ourselves into the heads of whoever is designing this committee. And if I read into it, the committee has yet to be designed and there's no start date, nor do we know the rules and regulations around attendance, even though we are a member of FCM and one would presume that the same rules around attendance and remote attendance would apply. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, uh, I've yet to hear a case made tonight for the immediacy of this action and the need for us to move on it post haste. So what I'm going to introduce, Mr. Chair, is that this item be deferred until such time as this council is in possession 
of notification from FCM that this committee has been struck and instruction received with respect to attendance. And I'd be seeking a seconder for that. Could, could I get you to hold off on that? There's two speakers in the queue. Councilor McCreary? And I don't put, oh, Councilor Ventoberg just took his hand down. Okay. Councilor Carpenter? I, I thought this was about uh, medical marijuana and the problem we're having in the community. I, I don't know how this got turned into a big debate about climate change or why. Uh, if you really don't want me to be there, just vote against it. Let's not make this about all politics and turn it into this as a climate change issue. Uh, I told you I'm very happy with staying home and, um, and being, meeting virtually whenever that's possible. If you don't want Branford to be involved, one second, Councilor McCreary, we've got, or Councilor McCreary's got a point of order. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, I, I don't appreciate the remarks which appear to have been directed at me, which implies motive other than what I have said tonight. And I'd simply like uh, you to address that, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I guess the ruling on this would be, I, I, I don't think anybody's name was mentioned. I think we were talking in generalities. Um, I'll allow the, uh, the speaker to continue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I hope that doesn't affect my time. I, I just, the, the issue is, is about appointing me to a committee because of my position on medical marijuana and how it's an impact has been on our community, especially in Ward 4 and Ward 5. Uh, if council members really don't want me to be there, uh, I, I, I appreciate those that have spoken favor of me being there. If you don't want me to be there uh, for whatever reason, just vote against it. Um, we don't have to be involved, I guess. We don't have to, we can say to the community, we're not interested in what's going on here. We could say, well, somebody else needs to do it from another community if that's what you want. Um, but, but why is this one issue now about climate change and none of the other issues or none of the other things are about climate change? Uh, we've never addressed, my ward mate has done a terrific job at FCM when she asked to go to FCM. We've never addressed that as a climate change issue, have we? Um, we haven't. So, and people have spoken to an amendment that failed uh, after it's failed several times. And it, we've turned what is a good discussion about protecting this community into something very different. And I'm, I'm sorry that that had to happen, but if you really can't, if you really want to support that amendment going forward or however you want to do it, or some time to delay, uh, just take my name off, vote against me. Thanks. Before we go back to you for your, your, your deferral, Mr. Chair, I would just like, or Council McCurry, I would just like to, I, I didn't get a chance to speak to this. Um, the, the only reason I didn't support the, uh, the amendment was, I think what, what we're missing is an overarching policy on this. And, and I don't think uh, we can just pick one item out and say, okay, we're gonna not do it there, but we might do it over here, but we're, we're still doing it over there. I, I, think, um, I think it's been stated that there's no urgency to get this done. I, I think I heard that from Councillor uh, Antoski that, that they're not set up yet. So we do have time to, to do something here. But I think what we do need is a policy on, on travel. If, if that's what we're going to do, then I think there needs to be a policy that applies to everything that we do, um, not just certain things that we do. So I, I, I don't know if I, I'm not in a position to move an amendment or, or to even with, withdraw this un, until we get a... Uh, a policy that would govern uh, all of our activity as far as travel is concerned. Th th that would be uh, that would be my hope. But nonetheless, that's only my hope. Um, and I'm in a chair, so I'm I'm kind of hand tied here. So, but I'll, Councillor McCreary, I believe you wanted the, the floor. Yes, still, you got it. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Okay. Chair. Um, I'm going to move a deferral of this item. Uh, the deferral is contingent upon two things. Number one is receipt of affirmation by FCM that this committee is constituted and its um, rules and regulations regarding attendance. And item number two, uh, the preparation of a report which would lead to a policy with respect to out of town travel to venues beyond the city of Bradford County of Brant and Six Nations. And do you have a seconder? I believe so. Councillor Martin. Okay, that amendment is, uh, is on the floor. And it's a deferral. 
deferral. Yes, deferral pending receipt of time and place. Two pieces of info. Seeing none, I'll call the vote on their deferral. Through the chair, just waiting for Councillor Wall. How would you like to vote? The deferral of item 7.1, Representative for, M for FCM Cannabis Committee, carries on a recorded vote of 7 to 3. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows Councillors Utley, McCreary, Wall, Marn, Sless, Vanderstel, Mayor Davis. Members opposed, Councillors Carpenter, Van Toborg, and Antoski. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. That takes us to 7.2 and all the way stop at Evelyn and Bernard Streets. And I believe that's Council McCurry. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, moved by me, seconded by my ward mate, Council Martin. Whereas the vicinity of the intersection of Evelyn and Bernard Streets is well used by children and their parents on the way to school and to Wilkes Park. And whereas the neighborhood has no sidewalks for use by pedestrians and whereas shortcutting traffic has increased in the last two years and whereas the intersection has become more dangerous to cross now therefore be it resolved the staff be directed to implement an always stop at this intersection and um I, I i won't offer much more explanation than what's before you tonight members of committee but uh, councillor martin and i would certainly appreciate uh, your support to deal with this little ward problem okay uh, Councillor Carpenter. Yes, can we ask staff about when the warrant study was done and what were the results of it, please? Thank you. Through the chair. Uh, Mark Jackman, Director of Operational Services. A uh, warrant study was not conducted uh, at this corner. Uh, Mark, was one, was one not requested or is it, did this, it's not come to your table? Uh, through the chair, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Through the chair, just waiting for Councillor Wall and Councillor Van Tilburg to cast their votes. Yeah. Item 7.2, always stop Evelyn Bernard Streets, carries on, uh, on a recorded vote of 8 to 0. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, and Toski, Marn, Sless, Vanderstelt, and Mayor Davis. 7.3 is 40 kilometer uh, an hour speed limit on Sandra Street. I believe that's you, Councillor McCreary. If you could please read your uh, resolution and your seconder. Mr. Chair, thank you. It's seconded by my ward mate, Councillor Greg Martin, and reads as follows. Whereas Sandra Street is used as a shortcut between Fairview Drive, King George Road and Dunstan Street. And whereas Sandra Street has a very broad street, is a very broad street. Sorry, let me start over. And whereas Sandra Street has a very broad street width, which encourages high speed driving and whereas Sandra Street has no sidewalks for use by pedestrians, including local seniors and children. And whereas Sandra Street residents have expressed an interest in traffic calming. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Sandra Street be bylawed as a 40 kmh limit and that appropriate signage be installed. And that city staff make recommendations to Ward 3 councillors of further traffic calming measures could be considered. And again, I think it's self explanatory, Mr. Chair, and Councillor Martin and I would appreciate uh, the support of all members of this committee to support. Uh, this small uh, neighborhood improvement. I see no no hands up, so we'll call the question.
Item 7.3, 40 kilometers an hour, speed limit for Sandra Street, cares unanimously on recorded vote. Members of the committee voting in favor as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, and Toski, Marn, Sless, Vanderstelt, and Mayor Davis. Uh, 7.4, a recognition of Van Westaway. Uh, I believe that's Councillor Vanderstelt. It is, oddly enough, in Ward 1. <laughs> Cheers, Les. <laughs> if you could please read the resolution and uh, identify your seconder, please. Recognition of Ann Westway by Councillor Vanderstel in Ward 1. Whereas Ann Westway was a local Brantford resident and a longtime member of the Brantford Heritage Committee, and whereas Ann was a dedicated volunteer for both the Parks and Recreation and Planning Departments for decades, assisting with community outreach involving park and trail development, as well as researching the history of the city's parks while also designating interpretive signs for numerous locations. And whereas Anne has kept, has had an, a keen interest in natural heritage and whereas the city has recognized individuals in our community who have provided an exceptional service in the interest of Parks and Recreation Department and the community as a whole. And whereas Anne's dedication to the community meet, meets the city criteria with respect to naming and recognition, and whereas Anne's legacy and betterment of the city of Brantford is deserving of such recognition, and whereas it would also be fitting to recognize Anne's contribution in a natural open space setting. Now, therefore, be it resolved, A, that the protected open space lands bounded by Shellard Lane to the north of Blackburn Drive to the south through which a tributary E of the Dobney Creek flows be named the Anne Westaway Meadows and B, that staff be directed to design and install the appropriate park signage, including interpretive information describing the importance of this natural area, and C, that staff be directed to also install a sign that recognizes Anne, most importantly, recognizes Anne, and explains her contributions to our community over the years she volunteered. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Vanderstelt. Uh, I see no speakers to this. I, I'm just wondering, um, I'm not sure if Ann has family still in the city, but uh, if they do, I, I, I would tend to think that there should be some type of gathering to unveil these signs where the family is invited, but uh, I'll leave that up to the uh, the mover and the seconder. Uh, Councilor McCree, did you have your hand up? I did, yes, and my, I was good thing I didn't say anything because my mic was active. Okay. It's good not to say everything that comes into your head, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank Councillor Vanderstelt for authoring this resolution and bringing it forward tonight. Um, and I also want to extend my gratitude to Vicki Armitage and to Brian Hughes, who've been instrumental over the last little while in terms of trying to determine a, a fitting tribute to Anne. And I believe we have landed on one. Uh, Lan, uh, Anne was a, a champion of all things natural and old. Uh, and uh, she was a great mentor to many and a contributor to many initiatives in the city of Bradford. And it's both fitting and ironic that we're going to be honoring her with, with, a, um, with a, an, an interpretive plaque because Anne was responsible for the design and um, creation of most of the interpretive plaques that you see along the rail trail in the city of Bradford. Um, in answer to um, the inquiry post by the chairman, who, by the way, has done a pretty good job tonight. Um, let me say that um, Anne's family has been contacted, and um, I, I, I'm leaving it up to park staff to arrange something in the way of an event, and hopefully they'll be able to attend. They, there, I believe there are two sons, and they come from far and wide, so it's um, it may be a, a bit of a challenge to get everybody together, but... Um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to an event, and I know Mr. Hughes will be back for that if he, as long as he's not sailing. Uh, and it's it's going to be a, it's going to be truly a good way to memorialize uh, somebody that made such a, a significant impact on this community. Further speakers, seeing none, we'll call the question.
Item 7.4, recognition of Ann Westaway, carries unanimously on a recorded vote. Members of the committee voting favor as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Wall, and Toski, Martin, Sless, Vanderstelt, and Mayor Davis. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. Uh, Councillor Vanderstelt, I understand that you have a uh, motion you'd like to introduce tonight, so you, you have, uh, you want to waive the rules. So could you introduce your motion to waive the rules and understanding you need a two thirds vote to uh, to do that? Thank you, Chair Sless. I do indeed, hoping for a unanimous vote again. Um, it is uh, that section 15.11.5 of the city's parameter procedural bylaw be waived to introduce the following notice of motion after the prescribed deadline and to be considered as a resolution without prior notice. 7.5, disposal of residential curbside yard waste materials at Mohawk Street landfill site. Whereas the city's residential curbside yard waste collection program ended this year, November 26, 2021, and whereas seasonal weather fluctuations each year can vary the timing of spring and fall cleanup and to set out for disposal utilizing the city's curbside yard waste collection program. And whereas residents are currently permitted to drop off bag or loose yard waste materials such as leaves, grass clippings, flower bed materials, hedge clippings, et cetera, careful on the et cetera, as per eligible yard waste materials under chapter 440, schedule D, compostable materials set out for curbside collection free of charge at the Mohawk Street landfill site, while the curbside yard waste collection program is underway. Now, therefore, be it resolved, A, that the general manager of public works be directed to permit residents to drop off bagged or loose yard waste materials such as leaves, grass clippings, flower bed materials, hedge clippings, et cetera as uh, per eligible yard waste materials under 440 Schedule D, compostable materials set out for curbside collection at the Mohawk Street landfill site throughout the year, uh, free of charge. And B, the general manager of public works be directed to review on an annual basis the need to extend the curbside yard waste collection program by one to two weeks in the spring in the spring and or in the fall in order to assist and accommodate residents which may need more time to clean up their properties due to seasonal weather fluctuations and to assist with the diversion of yard waste materials from disposal at Mohawk Street uh, landfill site. And my seconder, I believe, is Councillor McCree. Okay, is there any discussion on this? This is just to uh, waive the rules. Okay, we we'll call the question, please. The motion to waive the rules carries on a recorded vote of eight to one with the required two thirds vote. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Utley, McCreary, Wall, and Toski, Marn, Sless, Vanderstelt, Mayor Davis. Members opposed, Councillor Carpenter. Okay. So would you like to move your resolution? You don't need to read it all again. Uh, I'm glad for that because <laughs> so, my glasses stopped working at the far side of the screen over here. So it's uh, great. It's wonderful. Um, yeah, uh, speaking to it further, um, Mr. Chair, um, it, I, oh, sorry, uh, I am the mover definitely, and Councilman Curry is a second. Um, I think way back past the, all our calamities, if you recall, we had difficulty uh, cutting the grass in a number of city locations. We had a lot of complaints being generated by the public because the grass was too long. There was, there was it was unsightly. There was you know garbage piling up and and, and whatnot. And it, it was everything our crews could do to get the mowers on the grass because there was so much rain. There's seasonal differences that happen all the time. In this time, in this case, at least uh, with uh, yard waste and, uh, and, and leaf disposal, um, the, the snow hit a little bit early, people could get out, uh, they end up waiting for the snow to melt. They put everything in a bag and, and there's nowhere to put it. The, the, the yard waste collection has stopped. Um, and then there's a, a charge again at the municipal landfill. If you do have a vehicle or someone kind enough to bring it down, um, you know, that it comes at an additional expense to the, uh, to the taxpayer. Uh, this hopes to, uh, this works to alleviate uh, 
some of that difficulty and uh, I would ask for your, uh, your, your continued unanimous support. Thank you. Okay, we're down to 17 minutes and we have just three notices of motions to introduce and this resolution. So please bear that in mind when you're making your comments so, or we'll have to stop and extend the hour. Having said that, uh, Councilor Antoski, you're up. Thank you, Chair Sless. I'll be very quick. I'm happy to support this. Um, we, it changes every year and you know we have certain trees that drop later than others. And this just gives them an option. It's not extending our contract, but gives them an option and it's going into our compost anyway. So this is a great solution. I, I thank uh, the council for bringing it forward. Thank you, Councillor Antosky. Councillor Utley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've had, this is very timely. Uh, I've had three or four residents uh, contact me saying, hey, I got all kinds of leaves to put out and uh, there's no pickup anymore. So uh, uh, kudos to, uh, to Councillor Van der for introducing this. Um, but maybe we should look at extending the program into the fall and in the spring uh, a little bit um, for these uh, irregularities with weather. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Martin. Thank you. I wasn't aware that the free drop off of the materials was limited to when the yard waste collection program was on. That wasn't my intention when I got the, the resolution passed over 10 years ago to allow compostable materials free at the landfill. So I really appreciate the, this, uh, this resolution to, to fix that. And, and part B, the, the number of yard waste bags I saw out at the curb uh, this last week when the, the yard waste collection program had already ended uh, indicated that we need to look at the timing of when that program ends. Um, and this certainly does that because uh, unfortunately all those yard waste bags would have been picked up by the truck that picks up the regular garbage and gone to the landfill instead of going to the composting facility. So it uh, undoes everything that we're trying to accomplish with our yard waste program. So this will fix that. Thank you. Councillor Wall. Can we bring the wording up on the screen, please? A uh, couple of questions. Uh, first question was, I just found out that you can take this stuff to the dump for free. Is is that true during this season? But now we're trying to make it so you can take it anytime. Is that standard practice in other municipalities? That's the first question. Second question uh, was, um, are we able to do this? I would imagine that it wouldn't have been brought forward if it hadn't been discussed with staff. But as far as I was aware, that this wasn't the same as just our regular garbage collection. And then the third uh, question is, I didn't see an element in here, maybe I missed it, uh, to do with public engagement regarding this in the sense that um, this program is confusing in the best of times. Uh, now that we're making a change to it uh, at the last minute, it will be more confusing. And I would like to see a friendly amendment, if possible, to add some sort of campaign mm -hmm. to relay this information to the public. And time. Is there anyone to answer my questions? Perhaps. Uh, Dean Hodgins here, manager of solid waste and gas utilization. Um, I think it is common in other municipalities to accept the materials free of charge, um, especially while the programs are uh, underway. Um, I think your next question was regarding uh, schedule. Um, the schedule is set almost a year ahead of time and we try and predict through historical operations uh, when the seasons will change or end. Uh, it's always been a difficult task for staff to predict when that will be and certainly uh, seasonal variations can affect that as well. Um, uh, we are appreciative of this uh, uh, notice motion coming forward because it does provide uh, staff with direction from council as to when we should consider extending the time and leading that into your third question is yes how do we advise the public that we have extended collections rather than ended them which is prominent in most of our printed material uh, so I think the best thing to do is try and endeavor through uh, our online platforms and the city website to try and get that word out as quickly as we can because it does one week we are collecting and our printed material may say the next week we're not. So it's important that we use, uh, especially even our Recycle Coach app uh, for the people that are online with it, that we get that message out to them that we are still continuing to collect. Um, that's a little bit of a challenge we'll be faced with, but uh, 
maybe as the years progress with this flexibility, we can uh, put that into our calendar as well. So I think my last comment on it, as long as it is friendly to the mover and seconder to add a clause uh, with no particular wording, but something along the lines of to work together with the city of Brantford's communication department to relay this information through the neighborhood association to let stop Brantford, whatever, like the, the standard stuff I usually ask for in these kind of motions. The mover says that's friendly. I appreciate that. And thank you for answering all of my questions uh, so quickly and greatly. You're awesome. Councilman Curry. Sure, thank you. Um, a question through you of staff, uh, just to receive assurance that folks who don't have transportation to get their materials to the landfill can still put them to the curb and they'll be collected as regular garbage. Uh, yes, through the chair, that is uh, that is correct. We're still keep continuing to clean up materials. Uh, based on what set out and what uh, staff are advised of, of areas of uh, remaining materials. Yeah, thanks, Dean, and, and thanks to your folks for going above and beyond this past week or so dealing with some of these issues. Much appreciated. All right, thank you. And Dean, if you can just confirm with, with our contractor that they are picking them up in our neighborhood, the leaves used to be picked up really, really early, and then the garbage came late, and we've still got leaf bags mm -hmm. sitting there. So, so a regular garbage contractor didn't pick them up. So, if we can just get confirmation, that would be great. Yeah, I'll pass it on to the contractor. Uh, sorry, through the chair, I'll pass it on to the contractor. We'll make sure things are picked up. Any further speakers? Seeing none, we'll call the question. Item 7.5, disposal of residential curbside yard waste materials on Mohawk Street landfill site carries unanimously on recorded vote. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillor Sutley, McCreary, Carpenter, Wall, Antoski, Marnes, Slaz, Svanerstout, and Mayor Davis. Takes us to notice motion. Uh, Councillor Antoski, could you read the, uh, the title of yours, please? Tow, tow truck regulation. <laughs> okay. And Councillor Wall? Hybrid meeting support, clerk's department. Thank you. And 8.3, Councillor Martin. Yeah, that's appointment of directors to Merchco Holding Company Board. And we've done it with 10 minutes to spare. Uh, there's no other business before this committee, so we are adjourned. <laughs>